use this word to uh, describe another human being, but I've heard other people use the word. I think it's a European phrase. Um, you are an absolute unit. Did I? <laughs> you guys say yeah. Holy cow, dude! I've been uh, last night. I spent an hour on your Instagram. I am an instant fan. What a freak you are! Well, thank you very much. Thank you. You're absolutely welcome. What what you are, how you are pushing yourself is just absolutely um, incredible, dude. No, I, thank you. Um, I'm working as hard as I can. I, I'll say that. Yeah, it, it, with a great attitude too, right? Yeah, you've you've got to. I think the thing is, is that the the, the only thing we, we we truly can actually control is our attitude. Um, so I think it's I think it's you know that is you know the prerequisite to achieving what you want to achieve. There's a lot I want to get out of you today. Um, the language barrier is going to be tremendous to overcome. <laughs> But <laughs> I'll I'll, tr I'll try my best to speak English. But I think we can bridge the gap. There are some uh, uh, important uh, commonalities. Um, Mark uh, McQueen is uh, I, I don't know what you call him. Uh, um, strongman, powerlifter, um, and uh, martial artist. He uh, just qualified for ADCC. That's the Abu Dhabi Combat Club. And for those of you who don't know, I think most of you guys do know, but for those of you who don't know, there's this thing called the UFC Ultimate Fighting Championships. And many years ago, it was uh, became evident to all the people who want to be the best fighters in the world that they have to have a pretty damn solid foundation in jiu-jitsu and grappling. And so it's sort of become the cornerstone. And, in, in, you know, for lack of a... I don't want to start an argument, but it's the most important martial art and the, and the, and the best martial arts to learn and Mark has uh, accomplishing uh, that at the highest level now, and also is one of the strongest people. Are you? Will you be the strongest guy um, at ADCC ever? I, I think so. I, I might not feel the strongest on the mat, but I think if if you if we were to go into the gym, yeah, I think so. So if we were to do like a, a bench press, um, your total, your bench press, your deadlift, your overhead press, would you, you, we would be hard pressed to find someone stronger than you. I'd I'd be confident saying that. Yeah. Are, are you the most um serious? I'm sure there's other power lifters uh, who do jujitsu, tons of them. Um, uh, other strong men who've pivoted to uh, to um, the martial arts and jujitsu. But did you do you think you took? Was it strongman you were doing? Would you say it was strongman you were doing? It, no, it was powerlifting. Um, powerlifting. Yeah, it was. It was purely powerlifting. I was doing. And and and, and powerlifting is deadlift, bench press, and squat. Yes, that's correct. Um. Uh. So if we were to do those three, if we were to do a total, you can't think of anyone off the top of your head who you're like, "Yep, that I I ran into that guy in powerlifting, and now he's in jujitsu." No, um, I mean I totaled my best total in competition uh, was 920 kilos, which is like 2,000. 130 pounds maybe, maybe like 2100 pounds um and that was done uh in the ipf as well um so if you don't know the ipf is ipf uh maybe not anymore but at the time i did that in 2018 um at the time that was drug free that was drug tested um and also it was the the, the strictest um the, the, the strictest rule set, you know, the strictest judging, um, you know, you had to walk out your squats. It was completely raw. You had a non-specialty bar. So you had to use a power bar for squat bench and deadlift, um, you know. So, yeah, I would say I, I think you'd be hard pushed to fight. I don't even think you'd be hard pushed. There, there's nobody, I think, would come in with a hundred, a few hundred kilos of that um, that, that competed the ADCC. Guys, if you go to his Instagram account, it's it's at Mark, just like it sounds, and it's McQueen, uh, M A C Queen Two. Uh, you will become an instant fan. You do. This is uh, Mark. Kind of reminds me of the guy uh, we have on, um, Jack uh, um, Magdalena. Do you know who that is? The the kid from I, Australia fighting in the UFC. No. Okay. He just. Do you follow the UFC, Mark? Uh, not not too closely, but I do follow it. Yeah. Okay, um, he basically lost his first two UFC fights or his first two MMA fights. Then he went on to win. Now he's won twelve straight, and he just beat Gilbert Burns. That's and, 
yeah, it's pretty amazing. He's just a kid out of Australia. He's a stand-up guy. He's a, he's he's not a he's not a ground guy, which is crazy that he beat Gilbert because Gilbert's a ground guy. Yeah. And uh, he lit Gilbert up, and um, and I, I would put you in the same camp. Anyone who wants to, we're late to the bandwagon, but we're still early because there is kind of no limit. Uh, you're looking at a guy that I think is going to um, has no limit. Totally off subject here. Have you? Do you have an agent? And no, no, no. I mean, look at this. Um, uh, look how you look here. I mean, you. This is um. As we know, Conor McGregor is a slow as his star. Look at this. Did you steal this suit from Conor? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you are ready to be in some Russian mobster film. Look at you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I'd say I I'd say I'd scrubbed up okay. Um, yeah, that, not a bad photo of me, and my girlfriend. My God, hey, uh, how tall are you? Uh, six foot three. Oh my goodness! But I I appreciate the conversions for those of us still under uh, living under the king's king's law. I appreciate you doing that in uh, feet and inches. And how much do you weigh? Um, so at ADCC, I weighed one hundred and twenty six kilos, which is about two hundred and um, eighty eighty pounds, just under maybe. Wild. Uh, I mean, you you're made for a movie. If if I'm if I'm living in Europe and I'm making a student film, I get this guy in my movie because the <laughs> chance that I mean, you there's no limit for you. I want to show this uh, before we get into the. Um, let me see where I, if I can find it here easily before we get into the meat and potatoes. <laughs> uh, here you are standing on the podium, and this was in February. Uh, yes, February the seventeenth. Yeah, congratulations, man! Incredible. Thank you. Had you had you uh, gone against either of these guys before? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the guy that was in third place um, mm -hmm. is a guy called Jean Luca. Um, he uh, is from I I th I think he's from Ireland. He has an Irish accent, but I think he he might he, he might have been born somewhere else. But I think he's been brought up in Ireland. Um, he's a he's a lovely guy. Um, I've had one match with him before. Uh, me and him had a match. Uh, it was actually a title match. Um, a ten minutes up only, uh, but one one year before this. Um, and the guy that was in second place, Freddie, uh, I'd never had a match with him before. Uh, and actually, he, um, Freddie, he's actually like pretty pretty famous in Europe, uh, maybe the world, um, but definitely in Europe and especially the UK for Jiu Jitsu. Um, he's a really big name. Like I remember when I first started um, Jiu Jitsu, uh, I'd only been training for a few months, and I remember hearing about him uh, and like just hearing like you know pretty big deal, and then like you know just you know knowing about him, and then you know fast forward you know less than five years, and I'm literally going up against him in the finals to go to the the Olympics of grappling. So yeah, it's funny how things like that work. He looks like a, a full size uh, man version of Patty Pimlet. You know who that is? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he looks like he looks like Patty if he reached uh, full size. And this other guy next to you, the guy who looks like a Mexican from Ireland, is he? He looks like if you're six three, he must be. What is he? Six six? Uh, I'm. I'm. He's, I think he's taller. Yeah, I think he, I think he is taller. Um, he's very good. He's very very good at jujitsu. Uh, both of, both of them are. Um, but I would say he's maybe like an inch, an inch or two taller than me. Yeah. God, absolutely wild. Uh, and then, and then the um, I think uh, right is is this the is this the final match at uh wh where is this at? Yeah, no, that was um I, that was at Grapple Fest. So that was um almost one year ago. That was at Grapple Fest, and that was like against a guy called James Thompson. Um, so if you're not aware who James Thompson is, James Thompson is actually a bit of a of a legend in MMA, um, especially UK MMA. Uh, he fought in Pride. Um, so he fought um, Fedor Emelianenko's brother, Alexander Emelianenko. Um, so if you watch, um, you, you will have seen it. If you type in James Thompson versus Alexander Emelianenko, it's called like the you know the most like the the, the most intense or the scariest the scariest um, you know face off ever. Um, he's a Really scary dude, like really scary dude. Like, um, yeah. Like, is that the very, first time you faced him? Yeah, that's were, the first time. And Mark, were you scared? 
Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, not for, uh, not not of him. I, I was. I'm not scared of him. Uh, I'm scared of. I'm scared of like not achieving what, what what I want to achieve, and you know, feeling like he could prevent prevent that. If that makes sense. So like, you know, I, I have my goals and I have what I want to achieve. Um, and then if I have like a match with somebody, I feel scared that you know they're going to, you know, get in the way of that and prevent that. But I'm not. I wasn't scared. You're not scared of, he's going to hurt you. No. No. Like you no. did to him. No, I'm, I'm, I, I am like scared, but it's more of like you know, it, it's, it's more of like my, my, my own expectations. It's going to stop you from your goals. You have goals. Yes, and 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 it's more my expectations of of myself and what I want to do, and I'm and I'm like you know what I'm scared of is that you know he could, you know I feel like you know he he could get in the way and he could he could stop that, but I'm not scared of um get getting hurt. No, was he the is this guy the um uh, James was he the biggest perceived obstacle that you had up until that point? Um, I wouldn't know. Uh, I wouldn't say so. No, um, I'd say my my up until that point there, my biggest obstacle um, was against a, a guy from uh, well, he's actually from Romania originally, um, but he lives in America and um, called Daniel Minasui. Um, he's you known in jiu jitsu as Big Dan um, from New Wave. I had a match with him three months before that. So if people that aren't aware of Big Dan, Big Dan trains at New Wave. He trains with like Gordon Ryan. Uh, and under John Danaher, um, and he, you know, he's won trials um, a couple of times already. He's already competed at ADCC. Uh, he's, you know, probably top five in the world um, at heavyweights. So I had a match with him at Grapple Fest. Unfortunately, that was three months before that. I unfortunately, lost that match. But I'd say he was the biggest obstacle. But also, I feel like going into that as well, I also didn't really have anything to lose um, because. You know, he was already, you know, top five in the world. And when I'd faced him, I'd only been training for, you know, I'd not even been training for four years yet. I think I'd been training for about three years and eight and eight months. Um, so didn't really have anything to to lose. Um, you know, because if I if I went out and made a good account of myself uh, and still lost, you know, it's it's not it doesn't derail anything. And then obviously if I won, that would have been great. Um, but that match was James Thompson. I think there, there, there was more pressure from my side in terms of, you know, I, I can't afford to be losing to this guy because if I if I if I lose to this guy, there's no way I'm going to, you know, I'm not where I feel I need to be at this stage. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I totally hear you. If you lost to that guy, it's like okay, there's uh, I'm still on schedule. I can still get to where I want to go. If you lose to this guy, you're not really supposed to lose to this guy if to be to stay yeah. on your schedule. But he's good. It, um, Mark, what happens here? What I see is he taps, and you're looking around for the referee to stop the match. But since you don't see him, you don't stop. Yeah. So so basically, um, uh, I do loosen up. But, but basically, you know, in in jiu-jitsu there's there's a thing called a brazilian tap um for people that aren't aware and basically people in competition have like been in a submission and done like a tap um but it's maybe a subtle or whatever and then you let go and then the ref doesn't see it and then they claim they're not tapped and then you know you have to reset um so a general rule that you know we kind of go by um or my, my coach tells us to go by um not in every comp but in a comp like this where we're both professional athletes we're both getting paid to be there is you don't stop till the referee stops it so they tap and the referee hasn't stopped it you you know you have to keep going where uh, is he why why does it take him so i mean would you say i feel like he's a little slow would you say he's a little slow yeah i'd say he was he was he was he was a little slow so basically um when he tapped he tapped right as he went unconscious so then when I'm looking around, I'm not actually squeezing anymore. I'm holding it, um, but I'm not actually squeezing. So it does look worse than it actually is. So as as you can see, so like that's obviously like 100% effort. Um, and then as I readjust there, he then taps and then he pretty much goes unconscious there. As I'm looking around, I like loosen up. So I'm not actually squeezing anymore. I'm just not letting go. So it's not like I was like still squeezing 100%. I like let, I'd let go of the squeeze and just like holding position. But I would say that the ref, the ref could have been a little bit, a little bit quicker for sure. 
Is any part of you af afraid to squeeze a man at a hundred percent? No. Well, uh, like as no, no. you start squeezing, is no part of you is like, hey, you probably shouldn't do this to another human. N not in <laughs> not in that context. No. Um, okay. No. If if it was like if it was um, a, a local competition, you yeah. know, so I've ended like a local competition or a competition where you know you pay to enter and the people I'm against aren't professional athletes and they have you know families and day jobs to go to the next day. Uh, I, I'm not going to to do that. Um, you know, I, I'm just not. But in that context where we're on one of the biggest shows in Europe, probably the biggest show in Europe, and we're both getting paid to be there. Uh, I fully expect him to do the same same thing to me. Um, my son was in a match recently, and the ref came over to see if the person was unconscious. And when he picked their arm up and and let it down, my my son thought that it was uh, the referee stopping the match. Ah, uh, yeah. And the kid got out of the choke, and, uh, and and my son ended up losing the match. Yeah. So see, that's the that's one of the things where um, you know I've had it happen to me. Um, it was like one of my first competitions ever when I was a white belt. Uh, I had a guy in a, um, in a submission and he tapped and I let go and the ref never saw it. And then he was like, no, I didn't tap. Um, luckily, I, I still won that match. But um, pretty much ever since then, I was like, yeah, no, if that happens again, uh, I'm going to wait till the ref stops it. Yeah, you, you learn that lesson once and everyone else pays for it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mark, are you're, born, you're born and raised in Scotland? Yep, in Glasgow. And uh, what year were you born? 1994. Wow. And uh, uh, mom and dad um, raised you to be an athlete? Or how does this happen? As a young man, when do you know that you want to be a, a, a kid who plays sports and is physical? Yeah, good question. So we, my, my mom and dad aren't, aren't athletes. Um, my, my dad really hasn't really ever trained a day in his life, to be honest. The, the most hardworking man I've ever met, but that was with, you know, his his job and business and stuff like that. Um, and, um, you know, wasn't, you know, he was into sports, like watching sports, but never really played them. Um, but I grew up playing sports my whole life. So I grew up playing rugby uh, until about the age of eight or nine. Um, and uh, then stopped that and, and played football at the same time and then gave up rugby for football. Which well, in hindsight, football is what we call soccer. Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. Which in hindsight was a probably a stupid decision because I was really really good at rugby and I wasn't very good at football. Um, and uh, but I wanted to play with my friends and you're you're so young at that age. Um, and then I played football and then when I was around eleven years old, I started doing boxing. Um, so I do football and boxing uh, and I did boxing competitively. Um, and I, I got, I would say I was very good at boxing, um, but I would say that uh, I let myself down. Uh, I was not hard, which is very different to now, but I wasn't hard working. Um, I didn't really give it very much effort at all. I would say I slacked off. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I kind of feel like I had a lot of, I could have been very good if I'd wanted to be, but I didn't really want to be. And, the, you know, the, the the results and the efforts showed that. Um, but continued to competitively box up until I was like 16 um, and play football. Uh, and then when I was 16, I had, uh, I was playing football and I tore the ACL in my hmm. left knee. So I fully ruptured my ACL. Uh, Were you wearing cleats? Were you wearing cleats? Uh, studs, yeah. Studs, yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, f I basically I was running. No one was near me. Uh, I turned and the studs got caught in the ground, and you know I turned, my foot didn't, uh, and fully ruptured my ACL, partially tore my PCL, uh, tore my meniscus right down the middle, um, and messed my knee up. So I had to have a knee reconstruction. Um, so in in the process, I was like, well, I can't really do boxing anymore. I can't do football. Um, I'm going to start doing weights, and I'd always I'd always been obsessed um, with uh, like really strong men. Now I know that sounds a little bit dodgy, uh, but like had just always been like, so obsessed. Like, and here's a funny story: um, I was maybe ten years old, and my dad said I was walking down. Uh, we were on hot. We were on a family holiday, and he was walking down the beach with me. And this man walked by, and my dad said he was just like huge, like just muscles popping out of everywhere 
and it basically just said the way I stared at him, like I just like you know, like just followed him for miles. And he said, like you know, I was actually a little bit worried about you because he was like you know just the way you were, <laughs> he was like the way you were looking at him. But I was just like obsessed. So started lifting weights, and really, really up until I started lifting weights, I'd never really been good at anything. Uh, if I'm being honest, uh, I was terrible in school. Um, and all, all this is my fault, but it's terrible in school. Um, I had, you know, like really bad speech impediments growing up. Like couldn't couldn't really speak. Um, I had really bad delayed speech as a child. Like I would just couldn't couldn't speak for um, like a lot, like, a, like years after you were meant to. So really bad delayed speech. Then when I did speak, what? Go ahead. When I then when I did learn to speak, I couldn't even speak English. I basically just spoke. You spoke in tongues. Like, <laughs> and, well, yeah, the only person who could understand me was my mum. Just spoke, <laughs> just spoke in gibberish. Um, and then when I did learn, why to do you speak, think that is? What caused the speech delay? What, what What do you think caused? What do you think caused that? So they they, they don't know. So I, I did have like I had like you know a lot of screenings. You know, I had like a lot of screenings for like autism and you know lo lots of different screenings and stuff. And does that just really, make it worse for you as a kid? You're like, fuck you. I'm not trying that. Like you yeah, start getting kind of pissed, like, okay, I'll just accept being the dummy. Yeah, exactly. So basically, like, you know, and, and then like I had well, then when I did kind of learn to speak, I had a really bad speech impediment. What did that look uh, like? I don't hear anything in your voice now. You know, sometimes people have speech impediments, and then when they're adults, they sound like they're deaf. Yeah. So I, so I don't I, sense anything in you like that. Yeah, I, I don't really know. Uh, I'm 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 really not sure. Um, I just had a speech impediment and then I had to go to speech therapy and stuff like that. Um, and I think like the saving grace was was like my parents, like my mom and dad are phenomenal. Um, I think like if I without them or if I'd had different parents, um, I think like you know I could have easily gone down a pretty different path. Um, but uh, yeah, but, so like, by we, that you mean like crime and drugs? Yeah, and, and I was going down that way to be honest. Like you know, as a child, I was I was ter I was terrible, like so badly behaved. Like um, my dad jokes about it now, but like you know. I, you know, went to nursery and I got like expelled from like three nurseries, you know, <laughs> so that's like up to the age of four. Uh, and my dad said like every day, my mum would phone him floods of tears. You never guess what Mark's done now. Um, and then go to school, uh, go to primary school and was just terrible. Just like on top of like not being able to speak properly and having a speech impediment. I was just, I like, I was just, I was like so unintelligent. I was so stupid. Like I just, I couldn't under, I couldn't do normal things. I couldn't understand things. So like an example of this, it's like, I'm like eight years old and like, you know, my dad's like, I, I couldn't do basic arithmetic and like my dad's at home with me and he's like placed out like, you know, toys around the room and he's like, so we've got two toys here and we've got two toys here. So we count them up, you know, that's one, two, three, four. He's like, so then if we take two toys and two toys and we add them together, what does that make? And I'd be like, 37. <laughs> <laughs> like, just, I just couldn't do it. Yeah. I just like, I just couldn't, I just couldn't do it. But what I was really good at is I was really athletically gifted even by that point. Like mom said that like, I was like walking like ridiculously young. I was running really young. I was like really, really strong. Like I remember when I was like, you know, seven or eight years old, my big brother is like two, just over two years older than me. His friends would be around. And like when you're like eight years old compared to 10 years old, that's quite a difference. I'd like arm wrestling them and like just playing around with them. Um, so I was very good there. But they didn't know what was wrong with me. And I think there wasn't there wasn't actually anything wrong with me. They just said like, there's not anything wrong. He's just, he's just delayed. And, and I actually was just delayed. Like, I, I'm not actually stupid. You know, I'm not actually unintelligent. I, I, I can speak. It just took longer for me. I just, for whatever reason, I just couldn't, couldn't really, couldn't really do it. Was all, do you think all the speech therapy and all that attention you got for that was just a waste of time? You think they could have just rolled the dice and just let it go and, you, and it would have been fine? Yeah, I think so. Fascinating. I, think. I bet you that's the case in most cases too. I, I, I think so. But what, what, what I think is so good is that, Maybe it was because, you know, I'm 29 right now. So, you know, that was, this was 20 years ago. But I feel like, you know, maybe with different parents, if that was happening now, I feel like I would have been labelled with all these labels, like, oh, he's got ADHD, he's got this, he's got this, he's got this, you know, and I feel like that can really de like define. But with me, they, 
it just kind of le- left me. T- as, as, as far as I can remember, it just kind of left me to it. But I was so stupid in school, you know, couldn't really understand it. And then I feel like as a result of that, I kind of was just like, well, yeah, so I'm not going to try. And it's like then then you start self-sabotaging. So you don't try. You just deliberately misbehave. You, you act out. You're terrible. Um, so, you know, a lot of issues in primary school, but not, nothing too terrible. Um, but, you know, n- nothing too too like too like bad or too dangerous, but just, you know, in a lot of fights, you know, in trouble a lot, not particularly well behaved, um, nothing nothing dreadful. Um, then go to secondary school. Let me ask you this, Mark. Do you think that that's um, – there, there's two ways to look at it. Do you think on one hand you did those things because you just had energy and it wasn't being funneled anywhere? And, you know, they say um, the devil gives idle hands work. But also, you could think the other psychological component was um, to, to overcompensate, right? I think it was probably both of them being honest. Both. Okay. Um, I think, you know, I definitely was a very high, you know, very like, high activity kid. Um, but I think as well, I do think, like, as I've gotten older and thought about it, I do think that, like, you know, I was deliberately being like a little ass, like a little asshole sometimes. Um, and like acting out, and then basically go to secondary school. So I'm not sure what the equivalent is in Amer- like in America or stuff like that. But secondary school for us is like 13 years old to 17 years old. Okay, um, it's called I think a uh, junior high and high school for us. Okay. it's like seventh grade to twelfth grade. Okay, so, so basically, but I I, I was because I'm born December uh, 1994. I was I'm young for my year, so I went to secondary school at 12 years old. Um, but that's which is even about, harder, which is which is uh, something that's really hard for kids, right? Being the yes, kid, yeah. I was even younger, so then went to secondary school, and uh, that's when things you know went pretty downhill with my behaviour and stuff. And um, started like hanging around with people that like you know um, where I'm not going to say were bad influences because I I was probably as bad an influence if not even worse to them. But I would say you know we were all not not doing very good things and you know, was fighting and going out at weekends at 12 years old and drinking and, you know, just, you know, really stupid stuff. And, uh, you know, no effort in school was, was you know, was terrible in school. And then what started to happen is, is the only thing I was ever really good at was I was pretty strong and, and athletic. But then everyone started to hit puberty and I didn't. So then I became really small um and like you know i didn't hit puberty honestly until i was like 16 years old um, and you were already a year behind yeah so, so i started okay. really small so it got to point i just wasn't i was just i felt like i'm just like i'm just a complete failure i'm you know i'm not good in school i'm you know like i'm i'm you know, so stupid i'm terrible in school i'm not good at any sports I'm were you talking me. good by 16 what did it just gradually you become a, a better yeah. talker or yeah yeah, so I would say around about kind of um, primary, you know, so I would have been maybe like 10 years old is when I probably started to be able to speak, you know. Okay, okay. okay. But, you know, that, that's still still very, very late. Um, maybe a little bit, maybe maybe 10 stroke 11. But, um, you know, so just started to feel, you know, like a failure, to be honest. That's, that's the truth. Just terrible in school. Not really good at any sports. Uh, I'm really, I'm really small. Like my first ever boxing fight, um, I was, I was 12, 12 years old and I weighed in at 47 kilos, which is like nine, like, which is like a hundred pounds. Yeah. About a hundred pounds. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So tiny. And then like, wasn't good with girls. So, like, you know, never had a girlfriend or terrible with girls. So just wasn't really good at anything. And then get to 16 years old. And obviously that happens with my knee. And, and also what happened as well as, is that, um, you know, the people that I was hanging around with, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, were, were also, you know, none of us were good for each other. Not people that I really wanted to, you know. One guy be. steals one pack of cigarettes. You're like, oh, I can do better than that. You steal a carton. Next guy's yeah. like, hey, I'll rob the store. <laughs> you know, like. And just, yeah. And just who could throw a ball the furthest? It's who could do the craziest shit. Yeah. So, I so had we get, friends. Yeah. So we, we, we get to fourth year um, and I am. Um, I'm about 15, I think 15 years old, and I'll never forget this. I, I'm not going to say his name, um, but there was a teacher, um, and he absolutely, he, he, in a way, he probably, he probably, you know, um, at that point, like, like uh, maybe this word's far too strong, but like, kind of saved my life or like put my life in a different trajectory. So 
he basically humiliated me in front of the whole class. So what, what happened was, was I was in his class and this guy was like a big, big, strong guy, you know, big, strong, bald guy, quite a, quite a, quite a presence. And I was just, you know, being, being like, you know, really badly behaved, misbehaving, um, giving him hassle, you know, just, just being, just disrupting his class. And uh, he basically, you know, not exact verbatim, but basically, you know, he 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 stood up and was like, "I've had enough," and he, he just absolutely went. He 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 absolutely just tore 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 me apart. Uh, he was like, you know, you I see people at like you all the time. He's like, you think you're, you know, you think you're this, you think you're that, you think you're, you know, you're funny, but you're not. He's like, you know, you're going to if you keep going the way you're going, you're going to achieve nothing. You're going to amount to nothing. You're going to be a failure, and you're going to waste your only life on this earth. He's like, and the sad thing is, he's like, you're not even stupid. He's like, there's no. He's like, you just don't even give yourself the chance. He's like, you're not even giving yourself the chance to try and succeed. He's like, you know, you're just, you know, you're just ruining your check. You're just, you know, you're basically just self-destructing. And you're not even giving yourself the opportunity. He was like, your grades, everyone thinks you're stupid. And he's like, you're not. He's like, you're just, you know, you're you're not even giving yourself the opportunity. He was a lot harsher than that, but that was the kind of point he was trying to get across. In front of a whole classroom of kids. In front of the whole classroom, and he tore me to pieces. Um, Did you cry? No, not 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 in front of them. I don't remember <laughs> after him, later not, on the way home. <laughs> but he he tore me to pieces. And he and I remember thinking. The, the one thing that, that, that stood out was he was like, you're not even stupid. He's like, you just won't give yourself the opportunity. And the thing is, is like, nobody had ever really said that to me before. And I never really thought that. So I was like, you know what? You're, you're right. Uh, and, 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 and at that, in fourth year in school, you do your, your first set of um, exams, which are really important, or, or you think they're really important. <laughs> so I'm like, do you know what? I'm going to give everything to this. So I uh, stopped hanging around with ev everyone, didn't hang around with anyone, didn't do anything bad in school, wasn't disruptive, sat myself and I worked so hard. Um, and I remember that I was basically, the the criteria the, 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 um, for the exams, the best I could have done was getting six, six ones and two, and six ones and six exams uh, and six threes. So that would basically be like six A's and two C's is the best I could have got with what I was with the exams I was doing. And I ended up getting five ones, a two, and two threes. So that's like five A's, a B, and two C's. Um and you know, so had you ever seen had you ever seen an A before that? Never, never, ever. Never, 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 never even think I'd probably even passed an exam, if I'm honest, if I'm being honest. But I worked so hard. Like I, I worked so, so, so hard for that. And I, and I'll never forget this. And my dad won't, won't admit this, but I remember I phoned him. I said, hi, dad, I've got my exam results. And he was obviously at work. And he was such a busy man. Like he was. What did oh. he do? What did he do, Mark? What was his job? So he was he, he was a salesman. He was an IT salesman. He worked in IT. Okay. Um, but he was, you know, he was working like 12 hour days. Like it was ridiculous how hard he worked. So I called him up. I said, hi, dad, I've got my results. And you hear him go, <sighs> okay. You know, like. This oh my is God. on a rotary phone, maybe, or a push button phone. Still on a uh, cord. Maybe uh, it would it would have maybe been a mobile phone, but a oh, very okay. you know, one from fourteen years ago. Okay, so I could tell him kind of almost, him almost brace himself for it, like oh god, here we go. And I told him, so I said, so I, I actually got the best best exams I could have got, Dad. And like he didn't speak for like ten seconds, genuinely didn't speak for like ten seconds. And I was like, hello, are you there? He said, no, I'm, I'm there. And he was just he was like so shocked, you know. And he he he, he won't admit that, but he was. Um, I remember thinking like this is the first time I've actually like 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 achieved something. Like, that's what it felt like. I was this is the first time I've actually achieved something. I remember thinking like if I so like I was like remember thinking like I'm not actually stupid. Like I'm not dumb. I was like I just never applied myself. So like if I actually apply myself, I actually can achieve something. And I feel like th th then things started to turn a little bit. Um, and uh, went and did like my hires and stuff and did well in them. But, uh, you know, ac academics wasn't something I ever really, you know, it wasn't what I wanted to do with my life. So that takes me to when I'm like 16 and then I rupture my leg, my, my knee, and I have to have a knee reconstruction. And what I did start your with friends think, Mark? Sorry. What did your friends think when you, um, when you kind of pivoted to from hanging out and doing naughty shit to uh, school? Well, I didn't really have any friends anymore. That was the thing. Um, oh. 
like I didn't really have any friends. And then like the people that I became friends with, like I knew I, I knew them because we would we, we we played for the same football team and like we'd went through all school together. But you know, they, they definitely weren't keen on me, you know, and, okay. and, no, and no wonder. Now they all did become like my best friends, you know, over the next couple of years. Um, but like, you know, it, it was pr- quite isolating. Were you, was it weird that you were in sports? Were you like, man, how, were they like, how is this bad kid still in sports? Like, were they, did you kind of bridge two worlds between the naughty kids and the kids who are like focused on sports? No, like, I'd say no. like in, in Glasgow, like everyone plays football. So okay. Like, okay. And honestly, like the people that tend to be pretty not well behaved tend to be the better people, the better people at football anyway. I wasn't very good at football. Um, but uh, yeah, so we get to 16 and that happens with my knee. And uh, start lifting weights and just just get just get obsessed and like that like, at sixteen years old like you know like that's when I, I hit puberty like my voice my voice dropped um it started to develop and then go into the gym and just got obsessed uh, and then started to you know like just just like endlessly research watch stuff on YouTube uh, and 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 just lift weights and. Basically, things just kind of kind of spiral from there, um, and uh, I felt like for like the first time in my life, I was like, "This is this is what I'm meant to be doing with my life. This is what I, I want to do in my life, uh, and like I'm not going to let anything not going to let anything get in the way." Um, and you know, I want to, you know, if, if I I just like was like I'm going to just put literally every, every ounce of my being I'm going to put into into powerlifting and lifting weights. And how old did you say you were? Uh, Fifteen stroke sixteen. No, no, sorry. Now, mm. I'm twenty nine right now. So, so that's thirteen years ago. Yeah, wild. Uh, and, and um, do girls start coming around after you hit puberty? Um. So when I was about seven, seven, sixteen, seventeen, I got a girlfriend for the first time, uh, and you know, she was like a. Like a, a long, like a kind of longer term girlfriend, like you know, like two two years, which I suppose at that age is quite long. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, I've 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 not been somebody that's ever really like you know gone out and and really chased girls. If I'm being honest, like I've honestly ever since the up until sixteen years old, I never really had the opportunity. And you're too young, and then from like sixteen onwards, I only cared about training. Um, uh, this guy, uh, Jan Clark, I think Jan is the one who actually showed me your Instagram account. Mark, uh, part of the young team. What's the young, do you know what the young team is? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know, yeah, I know Jonathan. Uh, oh, you do know him? Yeah, 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 I know, I know oh. him. Uh, so, um, the, a young team is basically like, like a gang. Um, like they, in Glasgow, they call them young teams, it's like a gang. Um, so when I was younger, like, not really, not really, kind of, maybe, but n- not really, um, if I'm being honest. But, like, you know, just terribly behave. Uh, when you when you started boxing, did one of your parents put you in that? Were your parents nervous with you doing boxing? They did, they did. I don't think they wanted me to do it. It was all came from me. Like, I wanted to do it, and um, I kind of, like, pushed it. And I, they, they didn't stop me, and they were really supportive, but I don't think they wanted me to do it, especially my mum. Uh, especially my mom. Um, and, and as far as your um, conditioning goes, which we'll get into, which it really I think it probably is what sets you apart from most people in in sort of the strongman world, powerlifting world. Your conditioning is like insane. Um, do you think uh, that played a huge part of it? The fact that you were playing uh, soccer and um, boxing, just because the I, t- tremendous demand on your heart. I, I think so. Yes. Yeah. So, like, so like I remember um, when I was again maybe. 15 or 16, 15 years old, probably, uh, probably not long before I started lifting weights. Um, my boxing club did a like a 5k, like like a 5k chat, like run for charity. Um, so 5k is like 3.2 miles. Um, and uh, you know, no training for it at all. We all just turned up, uh, and um, I ran, I ran the 5k. And it was like 16 minutes and 13 seconds, or something like that. How old were you again? 15. Wow. Okay. So you yeah, just like, threw caution to the wind and just got on it. 
yesterday I did a lot of running for like you know we did a lot of running for boxing but like you know we were just running for boxing but yeah basically uh, our, our, it was like 16 minutes and 13 seconds or 16 minutes and 27 27 it, it was one of the two and I know they're like 14 seconds apart but it was sub 16 and a half minutes it was a you know pretty fast time it, I want to uh, share two quick stories with you. Um, uh, there's a guy who was the fittest man in the world in 2009. He's now also a brown belt. Um, he wrestles here in um, in California. His name's Jason Kalipa. Yep, and, I know, yeah, and Jason, um, w- on his graduating day, his senior year, his principal in front of his entire graduating class made fun of him, and that really stuck with Jason. Like, fuck you, I'll show you. Yeah. And then another interesting thing is uh, Nikki Rod's been on the show a few times. And when I asked him, I was like, hey, man, you're young and there's it's got to be just raining pussy on you. He goes, uh, is it hard staying away from girls? He goes, listen, real men do not chase women. Agreed. I, I'm, I'm a fucking lion and they fucking come to me. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> you know what? I mean, just the way he said it, like it's nothing. And I go, well, you've had a girlfriend for 12 years. What if she gets in the way of like your goals? He goes, I get rid of her then. I'm just like, God damn like you know what i mean just like ice um so yeah it's it, it's interesting to hear you have two you know there is a um a bit of a a formula to um succeeding or or, or characteristics of focused men who are on a mission right that there's there's these growing up stories that they share and these his ability to uh, stay away from the biggest distractions in life. Obviously, I don't mean that in a negative way about women at all as a distraction. I just uh, they're just a really potent force that that we want to uh, interact I, with. Yeah, I think the wrong women are really, really can be very distracting and have a really negative impact. What would uh, a wrong woman be? Like someone who's trying to control you instead of elevate you, believe in you, or like what would that be? Yeah, I think I, yeah, I just think someone who's maybe not supportive or. You know, um, yeah, I just say isn't isn't supportive or isn't uh, you know, doesn't share share what you want to do with your with your with your life and maybe gives some resistance. So obviously, I've been with my girlfriend for quite a long time. Uh, she's f- phenomenal. Like you know, uh, she's you you know, Rachel is like the opposite of a distraction. You know, she like like she's like so helpful. Like she flies all around the world to all my competitions with me. Um, you know, she helps me with all my food. Um, you know, she's, you know, like I train like 16, 17 times a week. You know, if I'm ever like walking out the door and like it's very obvious that I'm like exhausted or, you know, not in the mood, you know, she's up, you know, Rachel's uplifting. Um, you know, she's like, you know, she's the opposite of a distraction. She she lifts me up and she is like, you know, she, you know, she, positively benefits what i'm trying to do you know she's the complete opposite but i could totally see how the wrong kind of woman could 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 like get in the way and i think like if you know you have to be you know you have to be disciplined enough to to not allow like you know the wrong people and the, like the, the wrong women in your life um i always like this metaphor i always think of it like this if you whether you're a man or a woman if you want to be with a bird Let's say a bald eagle, and let's say this bald eagle has a goal to fly higher than any bird has ever flown. That takes a really fucking special companion. Yeah. Because so many people see a bald eagle and they want to catch it and put it in a cage. And with this bald eagle, if you want, because they want to keep it because it's so wonderful, right? Mm -hmm. But with this bald eagle, if it if it fits, if you really want to be a part of this bald eagle's life, you have to be constantly not almost like pushing it away. Like you have to be setting it free and supporting in its goals, even though its goals may seem to take you further away. They don't. It just looks like that. And yeah, you're you are a magnificent um, representation of um, the male uh, human species on this planet. And you got there because you've surrounded yourself with people who who aren't holding you back i would assume they 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 believe yeah. in you and support you and, and if you felt that drag it would be horrible for you yeah so i would say honestly like from when i left school at like 17 years old um up until like you know up until like honestly like i was like 23 so like six years of my life, i i don't you know i prob- I, I honestly didn't really have like any friends if i'm being like really honest um or girlfriends or anything you know it was it was it was pretty lonely if, if i'm being like completely honest like i definitely had you know some some like men that like you know 
Ali. You know, I had what I've had. I'd say I had one friend. Um, his name is Ross, who I've been friends with like my whole life. Like he was very consistently there, but also like you know he lived a very very different lifestyle to me um, back then. So although he was like a really good friend, never really saw each other um, at all, like ever. Um, so I'd say it's like really really lonely. I'd say like around the age of like twenty four, you know, I kind of started to meet some people who I'm still obviously really good friends with, um, who like were kind of doing the same stuff that I'm doing and have the same mentality and stuff like that. But I, I would say like without even realizing, like I kind of almost just isolated myself until I kind of find found the right people. Um, but I, I don't think that was ever like a conscious decision or thought. I just kind of feel like. I don't know. I, I just kind of isolated myself from everybody. I'm just like, this is what I'm doing. Um, fuck everyone. I don't need anybody. That was honestly my attitude. And I, I don't really know why, but I just kind of like, fuck everyone. Don't want don't want friends. Don't want anything. Uh, I'm just going to, that's what I'm going to do. And it's like, almost like, you know, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to show all you. I'm going to fucking, you know, I'm going to show all you what, what I can do. How, how did you meet Rachel? Uh, so, so she does jujitsu. Um, oh okay awesome she does wow. she does she does jiu-jitsu so so honestly i i, I just i messaged her um on on instagram uh, <laughs> was she doing jiu-jitsu at your club mm, no she was she was at a diff, she was at a different club um you know they, they kind of intertwine because uh, her coach is a black belt is a black belt under my coach um so there was some over there, you know there was some overlapping but it, it was at a different club how do you, um, um, Mark, um, she's surrounded by, um, just dudes all the time, right? Cause she's in jujitsu, right? Yeah. And there's kind of this, I think most healthy men in the jujitsu scene are very, very courteous with the women, right? Like, yep. like if you're one of those dudes who creeps girls out I mean, you have to be, you have to overcompensate. Yes. Right? You have to, you, you, cause you don't want to make them feel uncomfortable at all because it's such an intimate sport and rolling around. Um, I, so, and then on top of that, probably every fucking dude in there is probably has asked her out or wants to, right? It's somehow su pushing it down, suppressing, wanting to date her. Um, how do you do that? Is is there a special, um, uh, is it like a spe really special, is it a really slow courtship? Like, how do you, how do you, uh, court a girl who rolls around with other men all the time? You know what I mean? Yeah. That there's a, there's a really fine nuance there. Everyone knows if one guy creeps out one girl in the studio, everyone within a week knows who that fucking guy is. Yeah. So, so we'd never trained together. Um, mm -hmm. and we, and we were at different clubs. Um, we'd never actually trained together. Um, we knew of each other, but never trained. But, but honestly, it was, it was really straightforward. I, I thought she was, you know, really fucking hot. Um, and I'm, I messaged her and then like, is you that know, what you said to her? Hey, I think you're really fucking hot. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, I messaged her. We went out a couple of days later, um, and and that was it. It was it, that, honestly, it was really straightforward. Um, you know, I think uh, yeah, that 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 was it. There was really nothing special or anything like that. Just you know, I messaged her, and then um, the rest is really history. And it was just on. Yeah, just we got on great. She's absolutely amazing and uh i was just like yeah this is this is this is what i want so I, I went for it uh you're you're 16 years old um you're starting to uh kind of get your shit together you've started working out and um in, in the sports that you played were <clears throat> soccer and uh you were doing obviously you were a good runner and boxing soccer and boxing when yes. do you stop boxing and when does uh, uh wrestling um uh, come into play so, so when I was so when I was sixteen and I tore my tore the ligaments in my knee, that's when I stopped doing football and football and boxing. Um, I, I still was involved in boxing for a few more years, um, like still kind of training and helping out with coaching and stuff, but was pretty much done uh, and didn't really play any football really again, uh, and just was lifting weights and just fully focused on lifting weights um, and, and and doing powerlifting, and then. Um, uh, and tw uh, when I was 22, so, you know, six years later, uh, I won the IPF World Championships in powerlifting um, in the under 120 kilo class. So I became a world champion. Um, and then the year after, I was 23, um, I moved up a weight class. So I went into the, you know, the super heavyweight class, which is, you know, there's no limit. 
uh, and I weighed 152 kilos, which is like 340 pounds, 350 pounds, uh, and I totaled 920 kilos. Uh, and then I started grappling. So I started grappling uh, in so in May 2019, and I've never done it before. Um, uh, it, does it suck being 350 pounds? So some Awful. a friend of someone told me. Um, you may know this guy too. A friend of mine, Travis Bajent, the arm wrestler. Uh, I don't know him personally, but I, I know who you're talking about. He says once you go over 300 pounds, you have to have moving air on you at all times. Yeah. So you he know, says I'll, like he says like you stand by fans. He said you have to have set a fan up on your bed. He said once you weigh that much, there always has to be a cool breeze blowing blowing across you. You're too big. I, yeah, like life just life sucks. Life sucks at that way. Um nothing's enjoyable. Um and you know, you know, no energy for anything. Like literally, literally no energy for anything other than the gym. Uh life, life sucks, you know. Um you at the time at the time you don't really know because it's kind of, you it's, it's amazing how quickly you get used to what you're doing and it's hard to remember um but once you lose all the weight you're like yeah that that was awful um it really like you really even dread even being one of the strongest men in the world if you're 350 pounds and you're on the couch and you realize you have to go back to the kitchen because you forgot to bring your glass of water with you you're bummed like that yeah, just, yeah and even like even even see see like stupid stuff. So like here's like, like yesterday, like yesterday, like at me me and my girlfriend, like you know Sunday's the only day I don't train during the week. So like we like got up, we went like a nice we went like a nice walk to get steps in. Um, drove into town, drove into Glasgow, uh, parked the car, walked to like you know a restaurant, got some nice food. Being that way, like wouldn't have done that. Wouldn't oh, have wanted, really? Wouldn't wow. have wanted. I, I wouldn't have wanted to go on a walk. I would have, but like would have hated it. Would have been, you know, my back would have been all pumped. You know, my my legs would have been tired. Like would park as close as I could to the restaurant because you can't be <laughs> Yeah, just like stupid stuff like that you the, like you take for granted. Like you're yeah. just like I can't be bored doing that. Yeah. Uh, 2019. Um, you uh, uh start grappling. So, what's the what's the thought? Tell me, like, what the inspiration is. Why do that? Why you're so good at your sport? Couldn't you have just kind of rested and coasted into old age and been like, okay, I won a world championships, I'm good. Like, why why take on grappling? Yeah. So basically, won a world championship, and that was like my my absolute dream. Like, basically, the only way I can describe it was like someone said to me, "You um, can win the world championships." but you're going to basically get taken outside and, you know, shot in the back of the head and your life's over. Or you never won the world championship, but you can live till you're 90 years old. What would you choose? And it's like, I would have been like, are you stupid? I'll just win the world title. Like, why would I want to live to 90 and not having have achieved that? I'm like, are you like... And you're not joking you? either. That's the kind no. of focus and commitment you no, have. No, no, no. Like, oh, like, literally, like, genuinely, like, yeah, like, that's the only way I can, like, explain how much it meant to me, like, if someone had offered me that, I'd be like, are you stupid? Like, wh what kind of deal is that? Like, of course I'm going to take the world title. Why wow. would I want to live to 90? Like, are you joking? Like, what, what interest have I got living to 90, having, like, never won that and been, like, a complete failure? Like, what, what's the point of that? Um, You know. God, you know, and, some, you know most people, most of us normal people will never have that kind of conviction for anything. Like, he, like not even for our, I mean, people say they love their dogs, but if you were like, hey, shoot you or your dog, you're like, my dog. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that that was my attitude. And um, do you think you were crazy? Is that crazy? Is that focused? Is that is that how? Do you think that that's a, a commonality? I mean, that's a great story. You think you have to have like, listen, kids. That's what it takes to be the best. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I think it probably is. Um, which I mean, I don't think it's unfortunate. It, it's um. And it's, I think something I, that, it's something that comes with youth. Like, I think if, if you had kids or when you have kids, you'll be like, holy shit, I can't believe I ever thought that. That thought may even scare you once you have kids. The, the funny thing is, is like, I, I was willing to, that was my attitude. And fast forward, I'm now just, you know, turned 29 a couple of months ago. Yeah. And like, I don't even do powerlifting anymore, technically. Like, I still coach and I still obviously lift, you know, as much, every week. But like, I'm fully focused on on, on grappling. Um, but that was that was honestly my attitude. Um, like it wasn't even up for that so much it meant to me. And then I remember I won it, 
So I won the World Championships in IPF. Uh, and um, the IPF is like the was like at the time in 2017, it was like the, the epitome of powerlifting. So I Where was I won that competition? That, Where was that competition? Uh, in Belarus. Okay. Oh wow. So so uh, and that was quite that was quite cool there. But I won that, and um, it was the worst day of my life. Uh, honestly, it was the absolute worst day of my life. So I remember like the the day was just so it was awful because um, just you, so you got injured. No, 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 no. Just I just remember I won. And before I know it, you know, I wasn't, I feel like I wasn't ready. I didn't take it in. Before I know it, the, you know, the medal ceremony had been over. They played the national anthem. I got the gold medals. You know, everything was over. And before I know it, I'm back in some apartment in Belarus myself, in my room myself, you know, with no Wi-Fi or anything. I'm just myself. And I'm like, is that it? I mean, what, have I, what, I've dedicated like my entire life, like, is, like is that like, that's it? Are you like what's did you that? Cry, like? Did you cry, Mark? Um, no, I didn't. I, when I won the European Championships, uh, I won the European Championships. I think three or four months before the World Championships, I cried when I won that because when I won that, I cried because I was like, I can fucking, I can do this. I, I know I'm going to win the World Championships. But when I won the World Championships, it was like too much. I wasn't mature enough to like. For, did you call to, your mom? Who did you call from your room? Did you call anyone? No, nobody. Just was in my room myself. Um, and so, uh, you, you know, so I, I won my first film festival, and I went to my room afterwards. I thought, and I cried, and I called my mom. I'm like, "This is stupid. There's no there there." And I, I don't know which quarterback it is, but there's some quarterback for the um, for some. I don't know if it was Tom Brady or someone. I saw it like ten or fifteen years ago on sixty Minutes, and the guy just won his second or third Super Bowl, and he said, "Hey, I would trade any of these to go fishing with my dad." And yeah. it's kind it's kind of you're describing that like you got there and you looked around and there was not like you achieved your goal and there was nothing there right and there and there was just like nothing there and it's like well honestly nothing's nothing's really changed like don't get me wrong like yeah like nothing nothing really changed and then you know I, I I then I started to become very disillusioned with powerlifting um and uh moved up weight class moved moved down to England so moved down to to a place called Leeds in England um to do to do powerlifting with some people there uh, and i did my best lifting there you know i totaled 920 kilos um and i know this doesn't count for much but like when i the week that i decided i'm done with powerlifting i honestly could have totaled a thousand kilos or very close to it. like i was like my estimated max was like a thousand kilos and my numbers reflected it i know talk is cheap it doesn't matter i didn't do it but like I, 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 know, I, was, I, I listen. When you, someone like you can talk like this, it's fine. Like I was, I was honestly like my numbers were at that level, um, and hated it. Was miserable, and I was, I was miserable to be around as well. And by this point, I did have friends, you know, like still like some of my like my best friends to this day. Like I was best friends with them back then. And were you with like, Rachel at this? No, you weren't with no, Rachel. You hadn't no, started okay, okay. No, and then. Um, and then, uh, yeah, like, they were, you know, they tell me now that like, you were f fucking miserable to be around. I was just miserable. Um, and then uh, disillusioned. And then basically, like, I'm done. I'm going to, you know, I want to coach. I'm going to coach, you know. Uh, and that's that's it. I don't want to compete. You, that just, you remember making that decision? Like yeah, I was in the gym. Uh -huh. I, was in the, I was in the gym. It was a Tuesday. I was in the gym on Tuesday doing deadlifts. And I worked up to turn, and I, my, I, I pulled 250 kilos which way back then was like, you know, over a hundred kilos below my max, you know, so, and I pulled that and I just walked out of the gym and that was it. I'm done. Just said to my friends, I was like, I'm done. And that's me. I'm not, I'm not proud of it anymore. So I went home. Hey, so and, for you, that's like a divorce. You know, what's crazy. So few people will do anything in their life. I'm trying to think the only thing I can't think of anything in my life that I would ever have committed to so much that I would have to quit the only thing I can think of is like my wife, like I'd have to get a divorce or maybe quitting this podcast. But yes. it's so it's so crazy that you had a hobby that was so uh uh and, and I and maybe I should choose a different word than hobby, but you had a practice, let's say a practice that was so intertwined with your life that you had to quit it. It's like fucking yeah. a, like an addict. Like the only That's thing you true. quit are like drugs or cigarettes or alcohol or some shit. You quit powerlifting. Yeah. So and I remember <laughs> I was I was so scared. I was yeah. so scared. I was so scared to tell people as well. 
Um, because the problem is, is that I feel like, and it, one thing that maybe I struggle with a little bit as well back then was like, whenever I saw anybody, you know, I felt like other than my very close friends and like my mum and dad and my brother or sister, for example, other than like, you know, a very small group of people, anyone I ever bumped into that I knew, you know, it could never have a normal conversation. It's always like, oh, like, you know, what's your next competition? What what numbers are you had? I saw you won the world championships. Like, what's next? Like this, like, all they cared about was lifting. All they cared about talking was your powerlifting this. And it's like, it's almost like, why can't I just like, bump into somebody and they just be like, how are you? What are you doing today? You know? <laughs> and, it's, and it's like, and I know that they're just being friendly and polite and actually it's a really nice thing that people are actually like, you know, even willing to be invested in like, in what you're doing with your life. And that's nice. But it's like, it then becomes like, all I am is Mark McQueen, the world champion powerlifter. Like that's who I am. That's my identity. That's all I'm good at. That's all my worth is. I've not really got anything else. So then give quitting was like, I was Isn't so that fascinating. Isn't that fascinating? You went from having no worth and that sucked to have getting focused and having ultimate worth and that yeah. was still empty. And so life's a trip, right? I, I think that's why so many people turn eventually find God or turn to religion or start and establishing I, values or right. I mean, because I, I, I remember, I remember being, sh I remember being so scared to tell my dad, like, like terrified to tell my dad and there's no reason for it. But like, I think it was because I think it's because like, would he come to your powerlifting meets? Was he a fan? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Okay, yeah, like okay. he, like, I, I, again, like, this is as I've gotten older, I think I've kind of, I didn't really know why I was so scared to tell him back then. But as I've gotten older, I feel like I kind of understand why. So, you know, my, my, my dad, you know, was the, is, is like the, the hardest working person I've ever met. Um, like, you know, he literally, like, you know, would leave the house at like seven in the morning, get back at seven at night. You know, my mum would have his dinner on the table for him and then he'd go back out. And he'd come to my boxing and watch me box, take me home. He'd take my brother to football, take me to football. You know, his, he'd basically be out from seven in the morning till 10 at night, go to bed, repeat. His weekends were like on a Saturday, you know, he'd take me to take Gavin to football, who's my brother, take me on the Sunday to rugby or take me to football, take me to boxing, you know, gave his entire life to us basically. Uh, and was just like the hardest working person I'd ever met. And I feel like growing up, all he'd ever met with from me was just like failure after failure, the hassle, and the police are at his door, the police are phoning him, you know, the school are phoning him, my mum's phoning him, just constantly hassled. Um, and I remember like when I kind of started to perf, then it was kind of like almost my opportunity to like really like look, like I'm actually like not a failure like you know it's almost like this is like was like my opportunity to like impress them or uh, you know even now it's maybe hard to kind of articulate i get it you want you want it um uh, i think we uh, all healthy kids have that you wanted to, you realized how much effort he put into you and you didn't want to be a shitty painting you're like yeah, look no, look yeah. your work actually paid off like you yeah. and you owe it you felt some responsibility to him like hey I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you're. It maybe didn't turn out the way you wanted, but look, you still made a good statue. Yeah, and it's weird because it's like I never felt like that with my mum, and like my mum was like, literally couldn't have had a better mum, like best mum in the world. But like, I, I never really thought about impressing her. But it's like maybe it's because it's like my mum. Like your mum's always going to think you're amazing. You know. You, you know. Yeah. yeah I but like, I really wanted to impress my dad, and I remember like being so scared to tell him because I felt like, well, then when I stop this, it's back to like I'm now just some average guy that's not good at anything. Um, but I remember I told him and then like, you know, he was so supportive. He was like, listen, he's like, you've got to follow your heart. If that's not what you want to do. You know, you, you don't do that anymore. He's like, you know, you've got your, your coaching business. He's like, you can coach powerlifters. You can do that. He's like, you can, I remember he was like, you literally can do anything you want. You've proven that. He's like, you, you can do anything you achieve. You, you set your mind to. He's like, so follow your heart. So it was great. So then, I was like, well, obviously I need to lose weight. I don't want to be fat anymore. Don't want to be this weight. Don't want to lose weight. Um, and then uh, my brother at the time lived in Australia. So he was in Australia and um, he did jiu-jitsu and he was a blue belt in jiu-jitsu. So I was like, oh, I was like, you know, 
I think I'm going to probably do like jujitsu, Gavin. What do you think? He was like, yeah. He's like, I think you should, that'd be great. He's like, I'll like type into this this Facebook group and ask where you could go to for where you live. And then basically went along. And then, um, you know, I remember I, I stopped on the Tuesday and I went on the I went on the Saturday and hated it. Absolutely hated it. I was like, this is makes no sense. I like I feel like a fucking idiot. How much did all, you weigh on your first day? 152, 152 kilos, so 350 pounds. Um, I was like, I hated it, didn't like it, but I was like, you know, I'm down here myself anyway. I only know like two or three people here and they all have their own lives and their own jobs and, you know, I don't really get to see them. So I was like, I'm, I'm going to do something. So just kept going. And then uh, I came home, back home to Glasgow. So I came back home to Glasgow uh, and then so you only um, did what you how many classes did you end up doing there? Maybe two two months. Okay, okay. But, and, but and, done uh, a lot. Done a lot though. I was going like every I was going every single day. Um so this is like, you at 350 pounds in the lower left hand corner? Uh yes. Damn, you held that well. Jesus. Yeah. Um and uh, then basically I um what's it called? And then actually if you go on my Instagram just, just out of curiosity, there, there, there'll be a photo around about um, no November 2022. There'll be a photo of me uh, with like abs and pretty ripped. And if you can compare that to the 150. Um, oh, I, I went straight to the picture with you and Paul Craig. <laughs> yeah. so I think it was, I was November 2022. Um, around about then I post a photo of me like with, with with abs and stuff, and that was like compare that to the hundred and fifty odd kilo one. November two thousand twenty two. Roughly, I, I can I can quickly probably pull it up on my Instagram. I'm myself. at November. Uh, I am at November of two thousand twenty two. I mean, you're lean as fuck. Even with, I can tell with the jujitsu shirt on. I just don't see you with a shirt off photo. Let me see. Let me see. Uh, I can even probably send it to you. Um, or just tell me the date. In fact, yeah, it's crazy. It goes from all basically lifting to then just so much jujitsu. In see fact, I will I will quickly send you the photo on your on on Instagram, um, just to show the the difference. Because I think I actually put on my story rather than a post. Um, where are we? Where are we? Yeah, what's the date? Go. You see the date? I've, I've sent you that photo on Instagram Messenger. All right, let me see if I yeah. can. Oh, if that came through. Oh, yeah. Is, is that an actual post? Uh, oh, my God. I cannot believe how, how much you changed your body. Yeah. Wild. Um, and how long did that take to go from that, 350 to that? Oh. Um, A year? So, no, no. Like, lots of... That was would have been November two thousand twenty two, so honestly, that was probably like four four years, honestly, of just um, work. Yeah, just yeah, absolutely four years. I probably looked like that on the right though, lot, like 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 a lot, like probably maybe after like three, two and a half, three years. I just had hadn't really had a photo of that before that, um, but yeah, quite a difference. Okay, so so um, you you're you're in uh, uh you're somewhere in the UK and you do yep. jujitsu for two months. You're you're move not enjoying it, and then you move back to Glasgow. Okay, move back to Glasgow, and yeah. I joined the gym that I still train at now um, yeah. with my brother, because uh, you know with my brother, and um, the rest is honestly history. Like I just started, um, basically started training full time. So obviously I like I basically like, I'm a strength and conditioning. Well, that time I was like I don't only a powerlifting coach. Um, but now, like, I'm a strength and conditioning coach, so I coach powerlifters and do strength and conditioning for, like, grapplers or anyone who wants it. And um, basically, because of that, it's all online. So I, I basically was able to train full-time straight away. So I was, like, literally from, like, t you know, like, literally two months in, I was training morning and night, um, grappling, um, training, you know. When did you start liking it? Probably after about six months. And why did you stay those six months? You, did you like the training? Did you like the guys? Did you like the conditioning? Did you what? Just, anything? It was, it was just like, well, what else am I going to? I've got to do something. 
Did you drag yeah. out? Did you dread going into the studio? Um, do you remember what you didn't? Did you not like it because you weren't good at it? You didn't know what you were doing. You felt like a fish out of water. It wasn't. No, it wasn't. That I wasn't good at it. I just. I don't. I don't. I just. I just wasn't very. Did you I, I not just, like the dealing with the other guys, touching the other guys, rolling with them like that part? All, no, didn't give. A no, shit it's about nothing that. to do with that. I just. I just was like, I don't know if I, I don't know if I like this. Uh, but then just as each month went on, uh, you know, like kind of after like five, five, five months, six months, I definitely started to like it. Um, but basically just trained full time uh, after, since like two months. Um, and then I got my brown belt after three and a half years. I know that's crazy. How did you do that? Well, I mean, honestly, after like, were you scared think, getting your brown belt? Were you like, no, no, slow it down, guys. Slow it down. Slow it no, down. No, because, because like, so basically my first ever comp at Blue Belt, um, I'd only been training for um, two years. So my first ever comp at Blue Belt because I got my Blue Belt, I got my Blue Belt after a year. Um, and then uh, because, and I would have got it sooner, but the reason I did it was because I went to the European Championships, the IBGGF European Championships as a white belt. Uh, which I won, and then uh, got my blue belt, and then COVID hit. So obviously COVID happened. Um, now, I luckily, me and, my, me and my brother basically moved home with my mum and dad, and they had a garage, so me and Gavin just trained every day, you know, multiple times a day. So we kept training full time. Um, so it didn't really slow us down. And my first comp uh, at blue belt was against black belts. I just entered the black belt division, uh, and um, I won, so I, I won, you know, double gold. So as a blue belt, and, you were beating black belts already. Yeah, and one of the guys I beat, he was smaller, but his name's Ross Nichols, and um, he he had uh, won ADCC trials previously, and he had been at ADCC, you know, the, the ADCC, so he'd been at the Olympics of grappling, so he was arguably at that time the best person in the whole of the UK. Um, now he is smaller, he was like 75 kilos, um, but it was in the open weight division, and I yeah. did beat him, and I beat him. So I then got my purple belt. So I'd only done one blue belt comp, got my purple belt after two years. Um, and then Mark, just, let me ask you this: Did they have? Did they kind of? Ha were you getting good so quick that it and you were so strong and and, and practicing so much that they basically they couldn't leave you in the lower belts because people would have started complaining, like what the fuck? Um, I don't know. It just my coach just said to me, "There's, there's no time to waste." You need I mean, to I've never heard belt. of anyone getting a brown belt in like four years. But I mean, clearly, yeah. clearly, you earned it because you qualified for ADCC this year. I mean, so it's like so. so when I got my, so basically, I got my purple belt, and then like you know, I'd only been competing a black belt, and like constantly beating all these black belts and stuff. And then I got my blue, my brown belt after three and a half years, and my coach said to me like. I could have gave you this like a year ago. Um, but he's like, but you're competing at Black Belt anyway, so it, it doesn't matter. Um, and then, um, yeah, so basically that after three and a half years, and then I won trials, which obviously like ADCC trials is like, is the grappling's version of, it's the Olympic trials. Won that after like four years and eight months. Uh, and yeah, you know, basically going to the Olympics of grappling with like less than five years of training. Um, I, it, it's great. Were you tripping when you saw your name on the ADCC, uh, qualifier? Like, I mean, I know you were there and you won it, but was it like, holy shit? Yeah, it was like, you know, it is, it's weird. Cause, um, I'd been to two ADCC trials previously to this and I had lost to watch or compete. Oh, to compete. to compete and I'd lost in both. Um, so both times I went out in the second round, um, and uh, but like I knew, like you know, I, I knew, like I, I'm like I know I can win this. Like both times were just like, you know, not taking it away from other people. They beat me fair and square. They deserve to win. But I'm like these people aren't better than me. You know, they're just you know I, I'm not you know I'm I made a mistake or whatever. And, and I know that's not fair because you know they they maybe made me make the mistake or they capitalized. But I was like I know I'm I'm as good as these guys. I know it. And then also I went to this trials. And I was like, I know for a fact I can win this. Um, and I did. So, yeah. How many matches did you have there? Uh, four. Four matches. And you won all four? Won all four. Uh, any close ones? Um, yeah. So, the first one uh, was pre pretty one-sided. 
to be honest. The guy, amazing, actually amazing at jiu-jitsu. But um, I'd say, like, uh, you know, um, I won pretty pretty comfortably. So, you know, I, I like, you know, in the first regulation, the six minutes, uh, I'd, like, passed his guard and stuff like that, took him down, passed his guard, pretty dominant. But unfortunately, I'd done all that before the time, that before the points started. So then when points, so he played it well. So then when points started, I wasn't able to score points. So we went to overtime. Um, and then in overtime, took him down, passed his guard. Uh, he also got two negatives. Um, I'm not too sure what his two, I think his two negatives were for pulling guard. So I beat him like 5 now. Second match was very close. And I knew my second match, I knew that the um, this would have been my hardest match, especially stylistically. This would be my hardest match. And um, the guy that I had, he's like a his name was Franco Pana. Uh, he like has won black belt world world title before. And um, she's like a black belt world champion in IBJJF. Um, you know, enormous, like quite a bit heavier than me. Not taller, but quite a bit heavier. Um, and very tactical, very, very tactical, very smart. Um, and knew that that would be the hardest match, but managed to get through him, beat him. Uh, and then, my th- then, but what happened was, was I had a nine minute match with him and it was like a war. Like it was so hard. And uh, I'd had one hour between the last 16 and his match, the quarterfinal. Then basically came off the mat and I was like, I cannot, like, I'm just, like, I beat him hardest match of the day gone. Perfect. Sat down in the stadium next to my girlfriend, exhausted. And they came up to the event, you're back on in five minutes. You got semi-finals in five minutes. And the guy that I was going up against was completely fresh. You know, he, you know, he finished his match, his his other his match in seconds. So he he literally won like within like 30 seconds. So he's fresh and I'm exhausted. And I'm like, I I remember thinking, like, how am I going how am I going to do this? Like, because it was against the guy that obviously was got the bronze medal, Jean Luca. Remember thinking, like, he's too good for me to go in this exhausted. And uh, then I remember my, my girlfriend was just like, like, Mark, you've, you've, you've been here before. You've beat him before. And, like, you've been tired before. Like, fucking, you know, very nicely was like, get a fucking grip. You're going to be fine. So I was like, yeah. It was, the, it was this giant guy. Uh, the guy, yeah, the guy on the third place podium. Um, uh, what and, do you do? Do you take a shot of espresso or do you take some uh, a pre-workout? Or, like, what do you do to get yourself up? So I only had five minutes, so, so nothing. Just drank water and electrolytes because I was, you know, soaking. So went into that match, and uh, and this is where... Do you where... even change your clothes? Do you even change your clothes? No. 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 Um, and I was, you know, but luckily, this is where all the conditioning that I do, uh, I'm, like, you know, like, kissing my lucky star. I'm, like, I'm so pleased I put all this effort into so into that match. And again, that was a hard match, and um, that went to overtime as well. So that went nine minutes. But again, like I won comfortably. Like I feel like, you know, I took him down like probably like four, four or five times. He was very, very good at turtling, so I didn't get the points for it. But I'd say I beat him comfortably. Um, and and then, is this the conditioning you're talking about? This fucking crazy shit. Yeah, yeah. Um, so then I beat him, and then I was like. But what, what was quite good was I didn't have time to think because I'm like, before I knew it, I was in the final because I'd beat Franco Pana, who was the hardest match. And then I come against this guy who I've had a match with before. And I'm like, this guy is a world-class black belt. And like, and no gi belts don't really, belts don't matter, like, honestly. But like, when I say world-class black belt, I mean like he is like world-class. And like, you know, like he is like right up there. Beat him and I'm like, right, I'm in the final now. And then I had like two hours between the semifinals and the finals. So I was able to go outside and like rehydrate, refuel, um, and then went into the final and I was up against Freddie Vosgrun. And um, you know, this guy, like, you know, is a little bit of a celebrity, like in, in the UK and in, in Europe. Um, and I would say he's better at jujitsu than I am. I'd say, you know, I don't think that's unfair to say. I don't think I'm putting myself down when I say that. I'd say he is probably better at jujitsu than me. Um, but I was like, I know I can beat this guy though. So went into the match and I knew he wanted to pull guard. But in the finals, you're not allowed to pull guard. If you pull guard, you'll get a negative. But if I take him down in the first four minutes, I get no points for it. You know? So I was like, I was like, you're not getting to fucking 
pull guard or I'm not taking you down and giving you what you want and not getting awarded points for it. So I was like kind of, you know, just hand fighting, not really playing into his game, not taking him down. And then what he was doing was he was taking wrestling shots, but with no intention of finishing the shots. He was just wanting to take a shot so that he could then like legally pull guard off of it. And then he took a shot and then he pulled guard, but he pulled guard too quickly. And I feel like he should have been penalised and got a negative, but he didn't get a negative. But now he's like where he wants. And I was like, right, we'll fucking game on. And then um, again, I feel it was pretty one-sided, to be honest. Like he didn't do anything to me. I was constantly like passing, almost passing. Uh, and then, you know, he never really did anything. And then I was able to eventually get a pass, uh, secure the points, and then um, one one trials. And like, that was like, holy fuck, like I, like, and one, like, I knew I could do it, but when it happened, I was like, I cannot believe I just did that. And and so now uh, it's coming up in August, right? Yes, August the 16th and 17th. And this only happens every two years? Yeah. And so you're, you're, uh, you and Rachel are flying out to Vegas. Vegas. Yeah, we'll be there. And it, um, how, is that a single elimination tournament? Yeah, so basically, yeah. You go and you lose your first match, you're out. You're toast. Yeah, and, and how many dudes will be in your division? Do you know? Sixteen. It's the top sixteen oh, in the world. Shit. Yeah. Holy shit. Um, it, can you get better? August is just five months away. Can you get better between now and then? Like, is is, is yeah. oh so much? Yeah. Because yeah. I think the thing is, is and and I've not even been training for five years yet. Like next month, I will have been training for five years. Yeah. So I, wow. I feel and like I am like training full time like when i say training full time like i'm like doing like 16 17 sessions a week um you know like, through six days so you're basically training two to three times three times a day six days a week yeah yeah um and um like my my entire life is is, is, is grappling you know like if i'm not doing it i'm thinking about it every session i go into you know i'm like this is what i'm doing this day this is my goal for this day um you know, I've even like, you know, seek the help of a guy called um, Jeremy Skinner. I don't know if you know who he is, but he's an Australian guy. Um, he's been at ADCC before, but uh, I'm getting like kind of online coaching from him as well. So, you know, he's like helping me. Um, and I think the thing is, is that it is great that I'm going in August. And like another cool thing is I'm the first person ever from Scotland to go. So I'm the first Scottish person to ever win trials and go. Um, but like going just going once isn't enough. Um, you know, it just isn't enough. That's not the goal. The goal is not just to be like, oh, I got to ADCC one time. And no offence to anyone that had that goal and achieved that. But like, as Michael Bisbing said, and Michael Bisbing said this in his, um, in, on his podcast several times, is a mistake he sees in people is there's fighters, they get off, offered a UFC contract, they sign the contract, they're in the UFC, and they're like, job done. My life, my life goes complete. I've got to the ADCC. And he's like, no, 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 no. That's the terrible attitude. He's like, you've now just got an invite to the party. He's like, mm. now is where it now is where it begins. Mm. And that's what this feels like. And now I'm I'm, you know, not a delusional person. You know, I'm not been like, I'm gonna go in August and I'm gonna win ADCC. You know, I'm not I'm not gonna be, you know, it's not putting myself down, it's not being negative. Uh, I'm gonna give everything I've got. Do I think I can win? A match, cup some matches, absolutely. Um, you know, do do I think I can medal at it? Honestly, well, maybe I am delusional. Honestly, yeah, I genuinely believe I can. But the thing is, is that this ADCC isn't what's important. I'm only 29 years old. Um, you know, no injuries, no nagging, nothing. Like I've got 11, 11 years in front of me in my weight class, you know, like I've got like 11 years. I've got five more, you know, five more ADCCs in front of me. So getting to, just getting to the party, that's not what matters. What matters is like constant development and constant evolution and like, you know, three, four, five ADCCs down the line. That's what truly matters. You know, getting there once isn't the goal. You know, eventually, you know, three, four, five ADCCs down the line, I want to be winning, winning this. Hey, uh, will you be the only, how many new guys will be there besides yourself? Do you know? Um, that's a great question. In my weight class, um, I don't know. Will they, I, if, if you're the newest guy there, would, do they put you with the best guy? 
Like, is it like yeah. that? So, yeah. so your first match could be against fucking who knows? Could It'll be probably against... be Nicky Rod, probably. No shit. He's yeah. going. He's he'll go. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, do people do people um do people freak out uh like if 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 in wrestling or when they're grappling and they go they go flat and then you're still able to pick them up? Like, do people underestimate your strength? Is do people freak out a little bit? Like they're like, uh oh, you think I don't... You put them in positions they've never been in before. That's a good question. I don't know. Um, in in the training room, no. Uh, I'm I'm like you know honestly pretty nice, well, pretty nice. Like I don't really, um, you know, I would say like in the training room, like I'm very very deliberately, uh, not like just like using strength, like you know, because I think as well you can get quite false feedback because if I could do if I you know I could try and do something, and if someone's some someone's much weaker than me, uh, I might you know just be able to do it anyway. But then if I go and do it against someone in my weight class who's maybe not as strong as me, but strong enough, and then doesn't work, I'm then getting like false feedback loops. So whereas like I actually really try and be as technical as possible, as technical as I can be, and like I'm constantly trying to like actually like evolve my game and be more skillful and get better at jiu-jitsu. And then, um, because that is what's going to separate it, you know, and I... So in the training room, no. In competition, um, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe. I'm not, I'm not sure because I've never really asked somebody. Um, if I'm being honest, I've never really asked somebody. But I think, I mean, there's dudes you're going against who they have really good deadlifts that are 400 pounds, and they're going mm -hmm. against the guy who's pulled 800. And it, at yeah. some point, they got to be like something weird so, like they got to experience some weird weightlessness at times that they're like well that doesn't make any sense i mean yeah. i'm trying to think there's a guy that you double leg i have the video here somewhere and yeah it <laughs> fucking crazy that that will have been from like november 2022 i think i know exactly you're talking about um i'll quickly go i thought that. i i thought i had it um tagged um, here let I me apologize. I'll send that to you as well. Um, Look at you. Um, and I'm guessing your conditioning it, when when you go when you go ten minutes and it goes into overtime, are you good? Uh, yeah, I'm fine. I I, I, put, I sent you that video on um, Instagram on your messenger. You're yeah, I'm best. fine. Like so, like for example, um, at trials there, uh, my first match went nine minutes. Second match went nine minutes. Then I had a five minute break. Um, at a five minute break, ah, this is it. <laughs> is that at a tournament? Yeah. <laughs> I mean that. I mean that's like one of those freakish videos that you see, like uh, the the guys in the Olympics, um, you know, who's only five two, and they show him jump and he's dunking. Yeah. I mean, you that that doesn't that looks like CGI the way you fly through the air. <laughs> yeah, and that guy's really good as well. That's Paul Lukowski. He's actually really good um, as well. Um, but yeah, so Hooray! oh my god! So so I had a a nine minute I had a nine minute match against um, Franco Pana, my second match, who is a black belt world champion and is like hundred you know 130, 140 kilos. I then had a five minute break and I had another nine minute match with Jean Luca, who's like a world class jiu jitsu guy. Um, and yeah, fine. Then done the done the the, the finals, which was eight minutes. I'm ab absolutely fine. Um, yeah, I would say like in my weight class, I would say like my conditioning is probably one of my my, my main strong points for sure. Especially especially my body weight as well. Um, will you go to Vegas early? Like pretty early? Like five so, days early? A week early? How do you do that? I want to. So as far as I'm aware, ADCC pay for you to basically fly they pay for your flights and accommodation wow um yeah so they will f fly me over um and uh i don't know if they'll pay pay for rachel but i'll you know i'll sort that and um, she'll be coming the same time as me um and they pay they put you in the mgm grand arena i think because it's the o2 arena that's it's in um and uh, so I think it's probably dependent on when they're wanting to meet when they, they will fly over. But I would want to go over early, yeah, a hundred percent, and get situated. Wow. Yeah. Oh, and and then and then and then will you stay? Do you have any plans to stay and uh, like train anywhere in the states before you go home, or is it come to handle your business and get back? Yeah, 
yeah, yeah, just handle business and then probably have a couple of days after uh, in Vegas, you know, because like my brother's going to fly over and a few of my friends are flying over too. Um, so they'll be there and obviously my girlfriend will be there. So have a couple of days in Vegas uh, after it and then it's just get back to business, you know. Have you ever yeah. been to the States before? Uh, I've been to Texas once uh, mm -hmm. for the World Championships in 2016, but uh, I'm, I didn't, like, I literally turned up, went to my hotel room, didn't leave, competed, went back to my hotel room, flew home. Um, what about um, other, uh, since, since you have a boxing background, what about doing other forms? Would you ever do anything else? Would you ever, like, uh, after after uh, ADCCs, to try MMA or kickboxing or boxing mm -hmm. again? No, um, no, and the reason for that is is because like my, my goal is genuinely like you know I've like I've got to on forty to win ADCC, so I've got like a decade or yeah. eleven years in front of me, and I feel like doing anything else would just be a distraction and a distraction from what my goal is, and I feel like if I'm going to do something, if it's not going to be benefiting my goal and it's going to be distracting me from my goal, then why on earth would I be doing that? So no, it is fully fully focused on on grappling. Um, Mark, a lot of um, uh, jiu-jitsu tournaments are just complete shit shows, right? I mean, it's just wild between the the fans screaming and family, yeah. too many too many people in too small of an area. How How is ADCC? Does it run different? Oh, I mean, I've never been to ADCC before, but yeah, like um, if you watch like the one and two, like the last one mm -hmm. uh, in 2022 would have been obviously or yeah. No, yeah or 2021 22 um i mean that was like yeah i mean that is it, it, it literally looked like you know like you're like a, like a ufc event or yeah like a really but how about the qualifier event. was the, is the qualifier pretty well organized too yeah the qualifiers yeah. are organized too mm -hmm. like it was a you know it's not definitely adcc but it's a very very well well run and very serious like taken seriously tournament yeah yeah, that's awesome. All right, dude. Hey, uh, great having you on here. Um, I hope to stay in touch with you. I am a, a huge fan uh, now. I mean, I'm so glad. I guess it was Jan who turned me on to you, but I'm, I'm so glad that uh, I came across your Instagram account. I'm able to follow you, and uh, I'm going to be rooting for you, buddy. And and I really Thanks. do hope that'll be really what a great opportunity. I bet. Are you chomping at the bit? Are you hoping Nikki Rod's your first match? Um, I'm not. Sing, singling him out, I just think logically, like he is probably going to be my first match. I could be wrong, right. um, but like, uh, you know, I think just logically it is going to be him, and uh, it's like, yeah, like bring it on, yeah. I bet you seem like the guy who wants to face uh, the absolute hardest challenge, yeah. I mean, and, and that, that's I think that's one thing that, um, maybe kind of I find difficult with like other people is like, I've like they jump to every opportunity I've ever, I've ever, I've ever taken. You know, like especially grappling wise, powerlifting obviously too, but in grappling, um, you know, like I'd only been training for like eighteen months, and uh, I had a match with a guy called Owen Livesey, um, who won, but like he was like Commonwealth gold medalist in judo, um, missed out on the Olympics by one placing. Um, it's probably like the biggest name in the UK for grappling. Like I had a jump to a match with him. Uh, jumped to that match with Big Dan. I've like been to every single European trials that I've been able to go to. Um, I've like you know been competing at black belt since I've been a blue belt. Like yeah, I've literally like jumped to every opportunity. And then it's like you know now i um, like been trying to get matches, and it's like people aren't jumping opportunities, and I'm like I don't understand. You mean people don't uh, aren't jumping at the opportunity to to uh, get on the mat with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't blame them. <laughs> All right, uh, Mark, I I, I hope uh, I get a chance to talk to you uh, when you come to the states in Vegas. Maybe we can yes. uh, catch up again before the event. And you can give us an update on what's going on, um, and I'll be bugging you. Uh, feel free to uh, chat with me anytime in WhatsApp. I'll do the same to you. Thank you so much for coming on, man. No, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Cheers, buddy. Thank you. Mark McQueen. Wow. Man, oh, man. What's the takeaway there? You will not become the best in the world unless you're willing to die for it. I mean, fuck, we heard him say it, right?
willing to die to win the uh, powerlifting competition. I mean, and then, yeah, great name, great name. Only one name would be better, Mark McKing. I don't even, is that even a name? Is there, I wonder if there is a Mark McKing. Mark McKing. Nope. Just Googled it. Didn't even get a Mark McKing. Not a single one. They're all Mark McQueens. Fuck, he could change his name to Mark McKing. Be the first. Holy shit. I mean, I mean, he looks like a, he looks like a guy who would be, have a hard time getting a match, right? Holy cow. Is, is that true? Is Craig Jones not competing at ADCC? I mean, maybe he'll get an invite. Thanks, Jody. Uh, great interview. What a cool guy. Yeah, really cool guy. He got a cool Instagram too. He's really lighthearted. Like for as, as intense as you might imagine he is and focused, he's funny. Like he got, he has a lot of funny posts. He busts, he busts people's balls. Uh, the thought of um, him putting his arms around you and wanting to do something harmful to you is crazy. Uh, Mick Sevon, there you go. Uh, it's all about uh, the money. What money? What do you mean? He, he's not doing it for the money. He didn't pick the right sports if he's doing it for the money. All right. So listen, tomorrow is going to be wild. Tomorrow morning is going to be crazy. Uh, Jake Berman's coming on. And on Wednesday, Jake Berman is going against uh, Colton Mertens to see who's the best at doing um, burpees. And they're going to do that on the barbell spin at 4.30 uh, Pacific Standard Time. 4.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, I believe, on his YouTube station. And then at 5.30 is when the real show begins. That's over at the Sevon Podcast. Bring your dollar or $2 donation. We'll be kicking everyone out who doesn't bring a dollar. Bring a dollar. Not really, but... And uh, Tim Murray will be going, the fittest man in the world. Last year's fittest man in the world. So, Colton Merton... So, tomorrow... Yeah, going back to what I was originally saying. So, tomorrow, Jake Berman's coming on. In the morning. And we'll find out. I've never had him on the show before. Get to know Jake. Find out about uh, being an entrepreneur. And then get down to fucking business. Can he really beat Colton Mertens? Can Colton Mertens beat him? Jake uh, Berman, the slow burpee guy. Yeah, that I do. Absolutely. <clears throat> I uh, Yesterday, uh, Garrett uh, and Colleen from the Glinton Things podcast hosted the show. I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet. I'm excited to give it a listen. I don't know when I'm going to do that. I need a, uh, I need a, I need a, a host that can host the show when I'm gone, like a, like a Joan Rivers to Johnny Carson. Is it Jeff Berman? Is it Jeff Berman? No, it's Jake Berman. Isn't it Jake Berman? Jake Berman. Jake Berman. Don't confuse me. That would suck if I called him Jeff Berman. Um, yeah, it's tomorrow, dude. Oh, look, he even got a little post. It's tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. I've always wanted to have him on the show. At one time, I had a Noah on the show, and Jake was in the passenger seat. He seemed like a cool dude. I got to chat with him a bit. It's happening. Colt Mertens and Jake Berman will settle it once and for all next Wednesday, April 10th, on the Barbell Spin YouTube channel. Who will finish 100 bar facing burpees the fastest? So that's kind of like the uh, co-main event. And then the main event will be over on the Sevon podcast when we watch Tim Murray, the fittest man in the world, do it. Let's look. We better. We should go over and see if Tim's been training burpees. Let's go see what the fuck Tim's doing. Tim Murray. Tim Murray. Tater Todd 11.95. Yeah. He better be. He better, we, this, his his account better be just full of him doing burpees right now. This last week, let's see. Um, oh shit! Look here it is. First most recent post. Here we go. Just a reminder: eight thirty p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Real Seven Podcast. I take on one hundred bar facing burpees after Colt Mertens and Jake Berman complete their challenge. Dude. Dude. 
Oh my god, this is dope. Look, he even has a little timer down there. Oh shit. Let hey, should, should we let's count these up? This is crazy. Is he gonna go a whole minute here? He's doing a test run on this. Is he fucking nuts, dude? Did someone count? The, oh, no. So for, he did 40 seconds. If you can hold that, you've got it. Holy shit. Holy shit, dude. Listen, uh, CA Pep, this, is, this show is brought to you by CA Peptide. CA Peptide is giving him a thousand bucks if he fucking beats them. I would love to raise another thousand bucks for him in the chat. That would be cool, right? Thousand people watching, dollar each. No, I don't. I don't know. Oh, is that a short bar? Damn, he's cruising, dude. He he's got some hang time in the air too. Damn, this fucker's going for it. This is so cool. See, I think... He... Two rep, 270 deadlift. Yeah, boy. Damn, Tim. <laughs> it's fucking awesome. All right. All right. What's he doing here? Uh, thank you, Murray Ridge Center, for having me out to be the keynote speaker for the Special Olympics banquet. I know my grandpa is smiling big right now. Oh, that's cool. Let's see. Uh, oh, yes, just. Um, I didn't. I know. I think I told Tyler. But I don't know if I told Mister Hatcher this. Um, my grandpa is a big reason that the Special Olympics uh, made its way from Cincinnati across the river into Ohio or into uh, Northern Kentucky. Uh, that's where my grandpa grew or my dad grew up with his brother who has cerebral palsy and my grandpa wanted them my uncle to have the same opportunities that my dad and my other uncle kevin and my aunt karen had to participate in sports um, and at that time it wasn't easy to travel from northern kentucky to cincinnati like you just eventually the inter 75 was i think just being built or oh the so, dude has yeah, fuck has of course lineage of good people uh, Sounds like his grandpa was instrumental in the Special Olympics creation in their area. Keynote speaker Tim Murray, Murray Ridge Center Special Olympics Banquet, April 1st, 2024. Damn, good job, dude. That's fun. Getting recognized for being a good dude. All right. He got his podium. The fuck is this? This looks dangerous. Nice. Oh, shit. All right. All right. Christ, sorry, to lower it. All right. All right. Oh, shit. Look at that fucking environment he's training in. Damn. That's a nice little setup right there. Holy shit. Oh, that's cool. He didn't have to worry about low ceilings either, huh? Look at that. Like, he's he not tripping. I'm right at that limit. At 5'5", five, five, I can kind of still work out overhead with low ceilings, but sometimes you bump stuff like lights and fixtures and shit. You don't got to worry about any of that. All right, I'm pumped. Wednesday night's going to be wild. Yeah, no problem, Tim, going overhead in the basement. No, he's good. He got that. 
it, it's a, a good preview. Uh, Sevon should do 50 bar facing burpees for time against their 100. I should, huh? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. What about the Vindicate drop, Sevon? That is a great question. Oh, my goodness. This is a... Uh, this is, I think this is going to be my new favorite shirt. Let me see if I can go. If I, what happens if I go over to there? Um, I don't see it. Maybe it's not. Uh, uh, maybe it's not up here yet. Oh, oh, it is up. Oh, you get the socks and the wristbands together. That's fucking cool. Thanks for asking about this. I, I need black, purple. I ain't doing no purple. That purple one will lower my T count. Can't be doing anything. No tie dye. I like this. Oh my goodness. I really, really hope that that shirt doesn't, that that shirt fits me nice. God, I hope that shirt fits me nice. Can't wait to get the hold of this. I'll, uh, uh what does this mean? Athletic or relaxed? Ath athletic means like you have to like look like street horner to wear it. And this is like relaxed is like it doesn't touch your uh, your handles, your love handles. Am I relaxed, dude? I'm a relaxed large. What is this one? No. What the fuck is this? This one looks dirty. You got a dirty one in there in the pictures. I'm going to go with a clean shirt. What's the difference between this one and this one? Oh, oh, this one's real black. Okay, that's what I want. Relaxed, real black, color black. What the, oh, shit. This is confusing. Oh, look, and you can add shit to the cart. How do you not have one of these? All right, yeah, those are going to be dope. That's a great design. Travis killed that. I wonder if that king uses Metuthian. Uh, relax is more vacation fit. What's that mean? Oh, shows off the guns with the athletic. Relax is Bryson? No, no, no. I hope not. I'm not doing that. I can't do that. I can't do, uh, I can't do Bryson. I wonder, um, Hiller made a commercial for, uh, CA peptides. I wonder if it's loaded in here. Oh, CA peptides with. Oh, why are there two? Uh oh, let me see. The information and context provided here are available from any corporate phone and are not intended as or to be considered substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Views and opinions expressed do not reflect those of medical professionals or medical community. Duh. This is called Milano 10 2. Oh, shit. Did you see that? Duh. That, is that. Um, oh, man. All right, cool. All right. We got the commercials loaded up for a Wednesday show. I wonder why both those commercials, um, I need to text those guys. Um, uh, why are there two Hiller commercials? We just need the most recent. All right. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Jake Berman. Um, oh, t I guess I'll be back tonight for with the um, Dave Castro uh, week in review. Let's, I, I guess we could see if he's put that up yet. I die. He hasn't, right? Some one of you guys would have told me already. Dave's week in review is up. The Dave Castro. No. What's today? Today's April 8th? No. All right. God, I hope it's a short one. One has the needle blurred out. Yeah, that's the one we want. Thank you. Yeah, we, we need the one with the needle blurred out. Uh, um, uh, 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 oh, yeah, Caleb already responded. Keep the needle blurred. Hide the needle. Probably right. Better safe than sorry. Thank you, Caleb. I wonder where Caleb is right now. Oh my goodness. That is a wild picture of um Oh, 
You guys want to do something together really quick? It looks like uh, Pedro's fake news is out. Let's watch that together. That's always fun. Let's do that. Um, what, what do I type in? Oh, coffee. Coffee pods and ones. Let's watch that together. And then go over and watch it. Uh, with, uh, you know, you got to go over there and watch it by yourself, too, so he gets the view. You know what I mean? Okay. Uh, here we go. First up, John Young previewed his new Karma Sutra book on spin this week. I don't think that's a terrible like position to come from. <laughs> yeah. Peak 360 proved during team quarterfinals that their team is close. Like really close. Like really, really, like really close. Total Marquinho posted a story saying teammates who jerk together stay together. Hashtag oh. jerking with my dog. Not Max. Please don't involve Max. Jeez. John Young reacts to team quarterfinals workouts. I don't think Cross <laughs> is that creative. Abigail Domit gets ahead of... No, that's not right. Abigail Domit gets in a bar fight. No, that's not right. I read that one wrong as well. Abigail Domit smacks herself in the head with a bar. There, that's the one. Damn. Ooh. John Ooh. Young makes passionate defense of games mountain positioning. To three spots. The winner is going to be Ricky. And Laura is more versatile than Ricky. And finally, after their partnership during the Open, Talking Lead Fitness remained true to their word that Rad is the best training shoe to. Oh, no, wait, hang on. Sell out with me. Oh, yeah. Sell out with me tonight. If you want real news, you can download the Heat One app, although it hasn't been updated in a while because they're busy preparing for quarterfinals, semifinals. Maybe even the games. Download the Heat One app now in the App Store or Google Play Store. Big news of the Heat One app. Hey, I First do, up, I John do, Young pre I do, I do think. Oh God, I, I need to call Tyler uh, and see if what's going on. If the Heat One app is going to have something special for uh, Taylor Self versus the World for quarterfinals, that's coming up too. That's going to be wild. We'll start talking about that nonstop. Hopefully, we can get Colton on, Dallin on, Jason on, and Taylor on uh, all before. Um, that goes down that those are going to be crazy shows too yeah what is up with john john better have his fucking mic fixed before uh, he comes on this show that was crazy john young stuttering no shit bitcoin's rocketing up again no shit like how much is how much is rocketing bitcoin wow holy shit wow 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 why? Why, why, why? What's the reason for that? Is is there, it, I mean, that usually happens if there's some sort of like fear that the dollar is going to collapse. Jesus. Oh, but look, but look, it was it, on March 13th. It was, at the, it was higher than this. So I guess it fell and now it's going back up. Okay. It's just doing its dance. Damn, dude. Six months ago, I remember it was twenty-seven thousand dollars for a Bitcoin. Now it's seventy-one thousand. Nuts. Wow. F uh, five year. Oh, in, in November. Okay, so it's at an all-time high. But I guess in November it was pre of twenty twenty-one. It was pretty high too. Hmm. 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 All right. Well, if you got if you own a Bitcoin, you done good. You done good. Mark McQueen, gotta follow that guy. Gotta follow that guy. Gotta follow that guy. Uh, did you guys see what's happening over in Brazil, by the way, with uh, Elon Musk? Anyone following that story? Let me just uh, bring this up really quick. It's worth noting. Elon deserves uh, Elon deserves credit for this. I mean, let me let me read to you some of this. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, South America's number one language is Portuguese, and the reason why it's Portuguese is because fucking there's Brazil down there, and that country is massive. I want to say it's as big as the continental uh, United States. Elon Musk says X will defy order from Brazil Supreme Court after Twitter files. The announcement comes in response to Twitter files Brazil reporting on Twitter's internal communications. 
from before Musk's 2022 takeover. Owner of X Corp, Elon Musk, said on, pl on the platform on April 6th that the company had decided to lift all restrictions on Brazilian accounts targeted by an order from the nation's Supreme Court. We are lifting, quote, we are lifting all restrictions. This judge has applied massive fines, threatened to arrest our employees and cut off access to X in Brazil. X is Twitter. As a result, we will probably lose all revenue in Brazil and have to shut down our offices there. But principles matter more than profits, Mr. Musk wrote, explaining X's decision. So basically, the government there has been telling um, Twitter or X, hey, you got to pull down these posts. They're misinformation posts. And they're actually posts from Congress people in Brazil. And Musk is saying, no, we will not censor. We will not censor. City members of Brazil's Congress and journalists were among those named by Brazil's highest court for censoring. Crazy, right? And Musk saying, fuck you. According to the internal files, Mr. Schellenberg shared Twitter in Brazil was threatened with a $30,000 fine. The company had one hour to remove the Congress members post or pay the court for non-compliance. What a great brand move, right? Just to fucking stand up to the fucking government of Brazil and be like, fuck you, free speech. Uh, Savon, didn't you pay some guy from Brazil to unlock your IG accounts? It was some guy in our, he was in Argentina, but I don't think he was Argentinian, but I paid him something crazy. Like, um, it was fucked up. What happened actually? It was, um, what happened? I paid him $800 to fix, bring my account back. Then he told me three days later, hey, you need to pay me another, I don't remember, I'm making it up, $500. And at which point I said to him, so that's 1300 bucks. At which point I said to him, hey, dude, we can do this three ways. You can just tell me you scam me and we go our ways. That's cool. Um, you give me my money back, the 800 bucks, or you bring my account back first and then I give you the 500 And he brought my account back. So I had it back for like seven days and then it vanished again. <laughs> oh, fuck, I go. Fucked. But anyway, whatever. I'm resided to um I'm reside I've put that like there's this whole list of things I have over here that make me cooler than other people. And one of them is I don't care if my Twitter my uh Instagram account goes away. Like that that's I mean I'm I'm just cooler than um I'm just cooler than other people. I just can't help it. But part of me has this like sick desire to see other people's Instagram account go away to see how they react. Oh, you guys want to help me with something? By the way, I, I, I'm, I've gone back on the Diddy thing. I was like, fuck, Diddy didn't do anything to like, like, so what if he's gay? I don't give a fuck to he did something to now I'm back to like, it, it's just like the Epstein case. Like, I don't even really know what he did. Like, I don't. Like I need Justin, I need to hear someone, I need to hear Justin Bieber come out with Usher and like say, hey, he made us lick his asshole, his Cheerio. And if the, if, if I'm not going to hear that, then I, I, I'm just not like, they haven't char charged him with anything. I was talking to someone the other day and they're like, dude, if he was innocent, he would have said he's innocent. And I said, I was thinking, I said back though, but if he was guilty, he would have said, uh, they would have charged him with something. Yeah, civil, right? Yeah, civil suits. Yeah, like blah, whatever. Anyone can be in a civil suit. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the clarification step. Okay, li listen to this. I want you guys to listen to this. There's something here that I listened to like five times yesterday and I cannot figure it out. Diddy had an affair with Usher when he was still in his teens. Not that. I know what that means. As a result, he forced a number of young rappers to come out as gay. Despite and, and why do they bleep out gay? He forced an, a number of young rappers to come out as gay. I wonder what that even means. Force someone to come out as gay. Anyway, I don't know what any of this stuff means. I did his best attempts to make it appear natural. There isn't a single situation in which an adult did he should share a bed with a teenager. Uh, I agree. Now, here it is. Here's the part. Now, listen carefully. Listen. Diddy and Usher shared a bed when Usher was 15. Nope, not that. Sorry, not that and Diddy was in his late 20s. According to reports, Usher also acknowledged that when he was 15 years old, he and Diddy went to sell Oreos, which is- What's that? Him, when he was 15, him and Diddy went to sell Oreos? It's illegal in the US and many- And it's illegal in the US? What's sell Oreos? Like sell, what's sell Oreos? Listen again to this. 
bed when Usher was 15 and Diddy was in his late 20s. According to reports, Usher also acknowledged that when he was 15 years old, he and Diddy went to sell Ori's, which is a to sell Ori's. Him and Diddy went to sell Ori's illegal in the U.S. and many other countries in wrapping up the tumultuous sell Ori's. What the fuck is he saying? Here we go again. Late 20s. According to reports, Usher also acknowledged that when he was 15 years old, he and Diddy went to sell Ori's, which is illegal in the U.S. and to sell Ori's any other countries in wrapping up the tumultuous narrative surrounding sell Ori's. Listen, I was really hoping uh, you guys are really pissing me off because I was really hoping someone was going to come in the comments and be like, fuck, Sevon really is stupid and old. He old. He doesn't know what self Ori's is. So you guys don't know either. By the way, this is all AI generated shit. Like there's once you fall down this rabbit hole on YouTube, like they can't say any of the people's names right. It's a mess. You can tell it's just all AI shit. According to reports, Usher also acknowledged that when he was 15 years old, he and Diddy went to sell Ori's. Sell Ori's? What the fuck is that? Sell Ori's. Hold on. Maybe maybe I'll, I'm going to slow it down to 0.75 and see what happens. Okay, here we go. Teenager. Diddy and Usher shared a bed when Usher was 15 and Diddy was in his. Okay, here we go. His late 20s. According to reports, Usher also acknowledged that when he was 15 years old, he and Diddy went to sell Ori's. Sell Ori's. Turn the captions on the video, ding dong. Thank you. Finally, someone. Okay, captions. Uh, oh, look it. Fuck, it says sell Ori's. God damn. Damn it. Which is illegal in the U.S. and many other countries. In wrapping up the tumultuous uh, narrative surrounding what's Diddy, illegal? years old, he and Diddy went to sell Ori's, which is illegal in the U.S. and many other countries. In wrapping up the tumultuous... Oh my God, I'm never going to fucking know. That's why none of this shit matter matters. That's why... The, the... That's, why the, that's why none of this shit... It's just all bullshit. I'm giving Diddy a pass until further notice. Like, I, like it's just all bullshit. It's just fucking garbage. That video was titled uh, Mike Tyson gives celebrity list of people who took the D from fucking Diddy. And and there it's it's 26 minutes of nothing. I watched it at two times speed. So I'm I'm erasing this. I don't even care what I don't even care what sell Ori's is. It's slang for touching butthole. Who knows what it is? Wait till you guys see this. Have you guys seen this? Um, Seattle has a... Uh, this is a fucking wild story, dude. The, Seattle has a, uh, a public defender named Stephanie Mueller. Stephanie Mueller. Okay, you ready for this? This is... Ima imagine you get in trouble for something in Seattle. Stephanie Mueller. And and this is the chick that fucking her dude. I think this is a guy. I mean, obviously it's a guy. This is Seattle's public defender, Stephanie Mueller. Look at this. This is fucking nuts, dude. Check on that. Yeah. yeah. So we were talking in A6, 845? Yeah. That works for me. All right. Do I need to sign in? No. I'll just have it here. <laughs> <clears throat> my comment about my client yeah i just met her she's really nice she's really smart she sounds like she's got the right idea about things i really support what she's up to and i think it's fabulous how about that god it do you she's accused of what is it criminal trespass in the first degree yes is she innocent or guilty she's innocent of course she's innocent okay well She's caught on video being arrested and protesting and allegedly protesting. So I'm trying to get all sides. So I well, my client has pled not guilty. My name is Stephanie Mueller. I'm in the uh, directory for the Washington State Bar Association. You can look me up. Okay, so Stephanie, thank you for your time. At this point, it, your client is being arraigned, though. It's all just happened. It, her, her hearing is over. Got it. It's done. All right. Do you know when her next court date is? I do. do you, I'd like to maybe just keep tabs if they're... Uh, uh huh. Dude. What the fuck, dude? I think that's a great idea. Do you, could you tell me when that is? No. Oh, take okay. care. Thank you, Stephanie. 
check on that. Yeah. So we were talking. Her nipples are 18 inches from her spine. Dude, oh my god. What's funny is my, my mom my mom was an attorney for the county for a while and I would just fucking I would just love to see my mom's expression if she walked into the courthouse and saw this. I would just be just be just I, it's the if you the thing is, is it's so absurd that everyone around them is pressing down. Like we we have um um uh you imagine walking by a tree and the wind blows, right? And you hear cracking or something. You, everyone looks up. Anyone with like a healthy sense looks up. Like there's just situations where you react to things, right? You hear a loud engine coming and you look you look on the street, like you know, a fast car is coming. There's just these natural reactions we have. Four 17-year-old boys are walking um towards you on the street at night and their pants are sagging. You cross the street. You know what I mean? Like you just have these natural instincts. When you're around something like that, everyone's suppressing all their natural instincts. Their natural instincts are going to be like, hey, are you okay? What the fuck's going on with your tits? Who did your makeup? Are you a man? Like, there's a hundred questions flood, even the most non-transphobic, even the most non-homophobic. Like, even if you're not, if you don't, if you're not having that, those reactions, you're pushing down your biology. There's no one, there's no one who walks by that and shouldn't stare. Like you should be like, what the fuck is that? It's like, um, uh, it's this time of year now where birds are starting to fill up my backyard again. And the other day I saw a bird I had never seen before. Or the other day my kids spotted a um, peregrine falcon. And you're like, wow, I've never seen that one. Like turkey vultures, you're like dime a dozen, you see them, you know. We saw a bird the other day soaring with the biggest wingspan we've seen. And it had a white head. We think it was a bald eagle. So we stare. I mean, this is just, this is just, I mean, this is, how even if let's say you just wanted to let's say you're like i understand okay let, let's say um if you wanted to be a tr tranny you would think you'd want let's say let's say i really thought i was a woman and i wanted to assimilate with women i'd want to like slip in under the radar right and just kind of assimilate like just be another spot on the dalmatians back just like hey you know i really feel like a woman and i really don't want a lot of attention but this this isn't this isn't trying to fit in anywhere. This is Cirque du Soleil shit. She might as well have ridden in on my a fucking about my client. Yeah, I just met her. She's really nice. Hey, would you? I would just like to ask the non-transphobic, the non-homophobic. Like, do you leave your kids with this thing? Would you let this thing babysit your kids? This really is a, at this point, this really is a thing. I mean, it's fucking amazing, dude. I would be so bummed if that was defend. I guess in Seattle, you might be stoked that that's defending you, especially if you're guilty because no one, no one has the balls to push up against that. Those tits are crazy. I don't even think that I'm guessing that maybe those aren't even implants. That's like some sort of like shield thing you're wearing. Damn. <sighs> you think that like that you think that Stephanie Mueller had like a normal upbringing? You think Stephanie was diddled at a young age something fucked up happened to her? Him. It. There, there's nothing wrong with looking at someone and judging whether you want them watching your kids. Like nothing. That doesn't make you Islamophobic, homophobic, transphobic. Like if you don't do that, if you don't look at someone and, and judge them, and uh, let, let's say there's someone's like, I don't know what the situation would be. For some, let's say you're picking a babysitter to watch your kids and you're not like assessing every nook and cranny of them to judge them. Then something's wrong with you. You're a shitty parent. Yeah, first of all, yeah, no one with a dick or ball should be watching your kids anyway, for starters. Fuck, man. All right. It's, 
Is it is it a prank? Yeah, it seems like a prank, but it's not. It, it is not a, a prank. It is not a prank. All right. So many fun. I have so many fun. Um... Okay, well, let's finish here. Let, let... Oh, I already did the Daniel Brandon's did you plan chess. Okay. Oh, how about this? What's this? Let's see what this is. We'll finish this. Something on. Oh, here we go. A few of you sent this to me. Here we go. I'm not a political. It's so good. It's it's just fucking 100% true. All right. See you guys this evening. Uh, the Dave Castro Weekend Review. Love you guys.